we're going to make steak alfredo with mushrooms. So the first thing I want to do, because this is going to take a little bit of time, like I said the other day, we wet brine the chicken, which we're going to do with the chicken we're going to make the chicken al alfredo with. So we're also going to make a steak alfredo. So this is a dry brine. So let me wash my hands so you all don't go, ew. So washing my hands, washing my hands. Still, ew, I know, ew, I know. There, my hands are clean with my other red towel. People blood. No, it's not people <laughs> blood. I'm not bleeding. It just touched my thumb. You see? You can barely see it. It's just a little touch. We have some of those fingers. It's right on. there. Can't even Don't see you it. Cut yourself? No blood in the food. So, go to the cutting board. This is a dry bind. Same thing as yesterday. Shut up. To explain <laughs> it. I got a, I got like a, a plugged up ear, so my way of talk is really weird today. So yeah, chicken blood. But you guys need to calm down back there. <laughs> so we want to put some kosher salt on the outside of the steak. General, generous amount of kosher salt. Because remember, we're flavoring the inside of the steak. So we need the salt to create the water on the outside of the steak will, as it starts to melt the salt, it'll start pushing the flavored water into the steak. And we're going to set this aside. You can see right now, it's just two pieces of tenderloin. And that little piece of salt got into my finger. Mm. So, good looking steaks. I'm going to set those aside so they can do their magic. So we're dry brining our steaks. Those steaks have been out of the refrigerator since I bought them. So they've been out about three hours. So I want, I want to cook my steak at room temperature. Just so the difference between the heat and the steak isn't so drastic so when it hits the pan it doesn't squish my steak and make the water start to come out of it. So we're going to do our chicken brine, which I said yesterday is uh, not bad. It's one gallon of water to half a cup of kosher salt to half a cup of brown sugar. That's a standard brine. So we're going to brine some more chicken today like we did yesterday. And this is a wet brine. So we did our dry brine and our wet brine. Today we're going to use that same, we're going to use a uh, fettuccine pasta from the store. And then we're going to kind of talk over the other pastas that you can get. There's a lot of those. They have ravioli, they have <coughs> flavored raviolis and stuff like that. You know what I need? Hang on one second. chicken oh cool mm -hmm. no I don't need those I told you I'm not cut it's just a little <coughs> it's, bar it's barely it barely touched my skin I'm talking it just barely touched against my skin I'm fine I'll live Do you want some I'm gonna make it yeah please How many <coughs> Two, I guess. so yeah I've got like a sinus thing going on so I'm gonna take a Benadryl real quick so we got our water for our chicken because we're gonna wet brine it and like I said, it's about, this is obviously not a gallon of water. So I want to put probably, because the brine itself, Rex, we're on Overwatch later lessons, just letting you know. We're on Overwatch. Oh, cool. Can I jump in? Please. Please, Rex. I do. <coughs> please. Please let me jump in. Of course. Excellent. Because I die like a champion in that game like a champion so we're going to put brown sugar and salt in our water so our standard brine is 
what is it? Half a cup of kosher salt, half a cup of brown sugar, to one gallon of water. And everything that flies in the air, we stick that in there for at least for at least a half an hour, up to four hours. Yes, Cherry, I play games rather horribly. If you go to Rex's stream, I, I think Rex is going to let me talk. He usually does. Then I'll be in there. I'll be the one getting shot in the face. That'll be me. <coughs> it's like every game I play, they'll fight monsters, and I will go and pick flowers. That's pretty much my job. I'm the harvester. They're the hunter-gatherer, and I'm the harvester. So, and not by their choice, that's just what I happen to do. What's my favorite game? One where I don't get shot in the face. That's my favorite game. Patterson? Like, uh, uh, what is that game? The farmer game? Farmville? Yes, Farmville. I will kill some people in Farmville. What's the one? Animal Crossing. Oh, man. So no Division 2 for you? Not, no, unless I'm just... If my, my plan in the game is to get shot in the face, I'm good. I will win. Because I always, I don't know why, but I have problems di distinguishing between background and enemy. So I'm like, is that tree shooting me in the face? Yes, that tree just shot you in the face. So we mixed up our water and our brown sugar. Now we're going to taste it to make sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A little bit more salt. Like I said, you want a salty sweet kind of seawater flavor, ocean water, like the good blue wash ocean water. Like ocean water from Sonic? No, not uh, ocean water from Sonic. <coughs> you can keep the ocean water from Sonic to yourself. So, like I said, we've already brined, dry brined our steak, now we're going to dry wet brine some chicken. If I can remember where I put it. You will give us the, oh, Jesus Christ, I always read my Nightbot. Me and my, my Nightbot have more conversations than me and my chatters. So if you're new here, welcome. If you're not, still welcome. Appreciate you guys showing up. Appreciate you guys hanging out. Today we're making chicken, or we're actually making, oh, James, James gave us some bits. James just gave us some bits. Thank you, James. I appreciate it. James is a rock star. James is a rock star. Thank you, James. I appreciate it. That is super nice of you. That is money I'm going to use on more material. Just like food, mainly food. <laughs> Buying food for the stream. Yes, you do, and you did. Now pull your pants up, sit down, <laughs> relax. We're going to make some steak and mushroom alfredo. So we got our chicken and our brine. Like I said, it's done. We just had to set it aside. I'll bring back my steak and show you guys. See? I'm frying chicken like my people do. Oh, okay. Well, that's hungry, good. Hungry I can't wait to get to the fried chicken section of this stream so that you all are going to just start throwing rocks at your PCs when you see how I fried chicken. So I got my steak going. <laughs> Hang on, I got a cough. All right, I'm done. So if you look, I don't know if I can show you this, but let's see. No, not yet. But you're going to see in a minute. You see how it's just nice and watch the water on top of the steak. It will start to absorb the water and then it will go really, it'll have like a puddle on top of the steak. That that lets you know that the brine is working. So we got a dry brine steak. We've got a wet brine chicken. We're doing an Alfredo mushroom, so we want to address our mushrooms. Now remember, this mushroom is like an umbrella, so it's made to resist water. So unless you cut the top of this onion or somehow score or peel off the skin, then this onion, or shit, mushroom, was I calling it an onion the whole time? No, you said it only once before. Okay, good. It's a mushroom. Apologize for those who are writing down onion. Because it is a mushroom. <clears throat> so anyway, I got nice baby bells. I found these today in the store. I was like, ooh, those are pretty. So we're going to use these for our mushroom steak Alfredo. Get my little container. Now, if you, oh, wait, before I put that in the trash. Yeah, that's right, I just dug in the trash. 
Now I gotta start over. No, 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 don't start over. Just scratch out onion. Yeah, just scratch out onion. <laughs> just write mushroom over top of it. So, um. In every recipe from here on out. Yes. Uh, whenever you get these little mushroom containers from uh, the store, make sure you pull the top of it off when you put it in your refrigerator. Just like everything else, these mushrooms have to gas out. And if you keep a lid on them, they'll turn all slimy really fast. So make sure you take the plastic off of it and just leave the mushroom in the container in the side of the fridge so they just can sit in there and they can breathe. <laughs> yeah, they don't like live more than a day from here. Who? Here. The mushrooms. No, the mushrooms don't live more than oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm obviously having problems reading. So, what I want to do... Oh, see, my knife's almost did it again. It almost guillotined me. Oh, I want to hone my knife, just like I did yesterday. What we're trying to do is put a little edge on our knife. It's not going to take much, because I really didn't use it yesterday. That's probably enough. Yeah, sharp knives. I hope that doesn't guillotine somebody. So yeah, make sure you uncover your mushrooms so that they can breathe. I don't know why they put them in those containers other than just to keep them from falling out. He can cook but not read. Maybe I should do reading streams for him. That would be great, James. Why don't you do some uh, count your metal finger streams for me too? Okay. Short book, one, two. I don't know. So we're going to take our mushrooms and because we want... Now we can leave these whole and then peel them, and then fry them, or basically put them in a dry pan to saute them off. Mushroom sand blue cheese. Mushroom sand blue cheese. Mushrooms and minus, blue cheese. Minus the sand, yes. Mushroom sand, don't put sand in it, and just make the mushrooms and blue cheese. That would be, that'd be way more tasty. So, like I told you before, you really don't wanna wash your mushrooms because they get really super slimy. So you just want to take your mushroom and you want to dry off that, that little bit of uh, material that they use to grow their mushrooms. Because remember, remember, they don't grow mushrooms in dirt. They grow them in like straw and compost. So the stuff on the outside is not dirt. There's not enough nutrition in dirt for the mushroom to grow. So the stuff on the outside is not bad for you. It's not like soil. So it doesn't have salmonella in it like most that's where it's, that's where you get salmonella is from soil so if you long as you clean it off you're good to go perfectly fine but don't wash them please don't wash your mushrooms they just get slimy and remember we're trying to combat water so if you stick them in mush mushroom and water then you just have a wet mushroom so what we want to do, because we're going to saute these off, we're not even going to saute them, we're really just going to, we just kind of want to dry them out. So we want to extrude some of the water from these. So we're just going to, I know you did, but I, everyone's making fun of my, the way I'm reading, so I had to throw you under the bus, Cherry, I'm sorry. It was just a reaction. So we're going to take our knife, remember cutting, angle to the cutting board, and we want to take our knife, we want to put it in, touch the cutting board, here, move mushrooms. And then we want to pull through with our slicing blade, which is the front of the chef knife. Slicing, cutting, chopping. Okay? So we're just slicing the mushrooms. So we're going, I want to make them a little bit thicker. To the cutting board, pull through. To the cutting board, pull through. To the cutting board, pull through. Simple. Remember, slowly get your skill up so that you have nice skill. And then the speed will come. Don't worry about speed right now. If you're just starting out using a knife, don't worry about your speed, work on your skill. Skill is more important. Skill is what keeps you from cutting your hands. So we're going to put our mushrooms aside in our little bowl. Same thing. To the cutting board, pull. I'm holding it in place on that, the stem so that it doesn't move anywhere. And I'm trying to make the exact same size cuts so they cook, basically, so they start to dry out evenly. Taking our mushrooms, we're putting it in, pull them back. All we're trying to do is make nice, even, pretty cuts. Go slow, take your time. It's worth it in the end. I don't know how many mushrooms I'm doing. I think this will be the last one. Because I think only, well, no, because Devin's probably going to want mushrooms and chicken. No, he gets steak. 
That's right. Devin gets steak. Dana gets steak. Gabby gets steak. Lisa gets chicken. All of them. Okay. Can you use karate for mushroom chop? Dana. Dana's literally sitting right here. He's talking <laughs> shit. Come on. Only yes. You, on text. But the quest, the answer is yes. You can use karate. Yes. Excellent. But the, the only problem with using karate for mushrooms is they tend not to end up looking as pretty as my mushrooms oh, okay. when I'm using a knife. All right. Cherry said all of them, so I'm cutting up <laughs> all of them. Yeah, yeah. Cherry is VIP, so VIP gets what VIP wants. So we're going to cut up all the mushrooms, like I said, in there. Get the knife to the cutting board for safety purposes. Because safety is the most important part when using a sharp object next to your vulnerable little hand. So I want a million dollars and a lamp dance. Okay, um, but I was just going to give you knife skills. But <laughs> I hope the other stuff comes too. But that does not come with proper knife skills. It can I mean, it could, I guess. I, I mean, bet there's some chefs out there with a million dollars in a lap dance. I know. I bet if you just did that on Twitch, <laughs> it, you'd make a million dollars. Just just life skills equals lap dance and a million dollars. That's that's perfect. I love it. <laughs> One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish is the first book I'll read. For you. Aw, thank you, James. That's very nice of you. I appreciate it. That, that's the nicest thing you've said to me, you asshole. <laughs> All right, so our mushrooms coming over to our stove cam. We did some adjustments on our stove cam. I don't know if you can hear me or not. I want to turn these on medium low, four on my electric stove. Does it look better? Yeah, it looks better. Where did I go? <laughs> Rex, it's always, it's always in a cornucopia of shit talk in this room. One minute you're fine, and the next minute James starts popping off, and then Cherry starts popping off with bad bad ideas and bad suggestions. And yesterday she was using, uh, she was telling me she cuts her vegetables with scissors. And I'm trying to convince her to stay away from the scissors, because that is not what you want to use to cut vegetables. But she said her skills, scissors skills are on point. So I'm feeling pretty proud, pretty confident about it. So I want to layer these mushrooms, because once they start to evaporate the water from them, I don't really want to crowd my pan. But once the water starts to come out, I've got to let that water go somewhere. So I don't really want to, so we're going to do those in batches. So we just leave our mushrooms there. Scissors, yeah, Terry's all excited. Scissors! So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to prepare our Alfredo sauce. And like I said, our steak's doing its thing, our chicken's doing its thing. We're going to deal with some garlic. So remember I told you the other day, when you purchase garlic, you want this part to be here like like dry and kind of like hay. Okay, like a hey. scarecrow's pubes. That's what you want. <clears throat> you don't want any mold in there and you want this to be nice and dry. And the garlic should be firm and try and avoid the bar uh, garlic that this outside of it's cracked. Because every time, I know. I tried to sneak that past you. <laughs> so, scarecrows, okay? Get, get it right. I can't explain it any other way. Go out to your local farm, go out in the fields, and pants him. And you'll be like, oh, look, garlic. So, we want to make sure that the outside skin is completely sealed. You don't want it cracked open, because remember, garlic is basically... a uh, meaty thing full of oil and once that starts to crack that means it's been sitting there longer and it's been thrown around and people have been digging through it to find a better garlic so avoid those you want them to be all sealed in like this okay yes thank you dana <laughs> thank you very much so we're going to tear off that top <laughs> and then my people didn't like being in those fields these <laughs> vegetable people Get flashbacks of the scarecrow. Okay, I don't think your people are in the vegetable fields. All right, those are those are Gabby's people. Wow. <laughs> hey, how's it going? Thank you so much, Andre. We just got a hundred bits from Andre. Thank you. I really appreciate that. It's still a bit, 
So I don't care. He could have <laughs> scarecrow pubes on the front of it. <laughs> I don't care. So that is not the lesson for today. The lesson for today is not scarecrow pubes. Just in case you wanted it to be, James, it's not. Okay? Well, it doesn't work. Whoop, didn't work. Work. It did what didn't work? What didn't work, Rex? Did my did my did it not work? Did my bitty thing not work? Yeah. No, but did it work in the screen? The salt thing's cool. Where'd you get that at? That's cool. I like that. Salt Bay. What? From Salt Bay. What is that? No. That's <laughs> not where he got it from. Get with the times. That guy's old news. This is this is Twitch now. He's like he's like he's like MySpace. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh shoot, Rex, you are so sweet. Oh, I did it. It worked. I just saw yours. Thank you so much. You guys are rock stars. All right, we're gonna have a, we're gonna have a bits war. I feel it coming on. We're having a bits war. Everyone hide your skeleton. No, not 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 skeleton pubes. No, I don't know where we're going. I have no idea where this stream's going. <laughs> Come on, Rex. So, we got our garlic. We peeled it. I always take the palm of my hand. I just push down on it. I don't want to destroy it. And I, I mentioned this before the last time we did this. There's people I've watched, especially like Food Network, it became a thing. Where the chefs on Food Network, if you call them that, they would take the back of their knife. And they put the, put it on the garlic, and they just punch the living Jesus out of it. And I was like, "Why? Why are you doing that to that poor, defenseless little garlic?" <clears throat> Thank you, James. Oh my gosh, you will give us. Oh my God, I said it again. There you go, James. James will do it. Yes. Don't destroy the pubes. Got it. Yes. Avoid destroying the pubes. Exactly. If you just came in, I profusely apologize for the <laughs> antics of my chat. But you gotta you gotta go where the crowd is, right? So if we want to talk about scarecrow pubes, <laughs> but it will have nothing to do with the food tonight, I promise you. There will be zero scarecrow pubes in my food. I promise. That's my promise to you. <laughs> okay. I think that's yeah, that's the best band name <laughs> ever. Scarecrow pubes. They're like a ska alternative punk band. Wrap, wrap your head around that. So you're supposed to shave them regularly or you end up with old lady bush. <laughs> wow. This is going down a dark road, folks. <laughs> this is going down a dark road. I just I was trying to bring up the point that the bottom of the garlic... <laughs> should, they play reggae. That's a good one. The bottom of the garlic should be dry. And then the words, those words slipped out of my head. Can you comb them? I would assume you couldn't with a rake. That's what rakes on farms are for, is to, to brush up the scarecrow pubes. So I got me some garlic. Oh, this is sliding off the hill, folks. This is sliding off fast. Okay, or braid them. Yeah, that's some long hat. You got to braid them for... Well, that's usually the uh, migrant's job. Uh, <laughs> so we're peeling garlic, and the conversation has rolled off the hill, <laughs> but we're going to continue on with the food, because that's what we're here for, right? Food. Not necessarily scarecrow pubes, but certainly you. What do you think of those chopped garlic in a jar? Well, in a pinch, they're great. And when garlic's not in season, they're great. Like if you go to the grocery store, and they have only all the garlic looks like what I told you it shouldn't look like. Those are great in a pinch. But realistically, I don't mind them. And sometimes, like, I, I have, you know, I don't have other, you know, other choice. And nobody likes to spend a lot of time peeling garlic. They also have, some grocery stores have whole garlic already, already peeled. They look like this. And they're in a container. I prefer those over that chopped up stuff that's put in oil. Because I just think it has more of an authentic garlic, stronger garlic flavor to it. Because you're gonna, but that kind of tastes like garlic. Like if you take olive oil and you put garlic in it, and then that kind of is what that tastes like. It doesn't have that straight fresh garlic, and those are usually pretty chopped up. I like peeled ones in a pod in oil. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. 
So any one of those is fine, and it's about really about preferential taste. If that's the garlic you like to use, then use it, you know. But I personally, I like the fresh, sweet flavor of properly toasted garlic, and you can't get that with those things just because they don't have the, you know, the, the oil itself has already been extruded from the garlic, and it usually ends up all mixed in with the, like the olive oil or whatever it's kept in. What about black garlic? Black garlic, I actually ordered some black garlic online and I didn't like it because it's basically the process to making black garlic is like they, ba they basically take garlic cloves and they stick them in a pan and they cook them really, really slowly forever and they turn black. And they're sweet, but they're super bitter. And you see now there was a trend, I'm glad it stopped, but there was tr a trend where people were making all, all things black. They were making like black hamburgers and they were using black garlic and they make a black bun and they would use like squid ink to make the buns with and it looked like fun but everything that they made like I had a few things and they all tasted really not good so it looked cool but eating it, it's like those cakes that you see on the competitions those look great but I would never eat one of those because that's way too many fingers that's way too many people touching did I do it again? Is this going to send us off in another <laughs> weird... Because of all the finger cakes that they make? My bad. Thank you. So. I'll take the blame for that one. Alright, thank you. So we're going to take our garlic and we're going to peel it. Because we want some garlic for our steak alfredo with mushrooms. Our mushrooms are making a nice cheering sound. Probably a golf clap cheer. It's not too loud. Because I just want to start extruding the, the water from the garlic, or no, Jesus, I said that like I knew what I was talking about. I want to start taking the water out of the mushrooms. So I got a little bit left here. I'll push down a little more. Ooh, that was good. Yeah, there it is. All right, hey, come back here. So we're gonna take our peel, because we don't want that nasty stuff in our food. Here we go, and that's why. And we've got, our peeled garlic. So we take our garlic that's remaining and we set that aside in our little garlic bowl. Now, um, that's almost ready. I'm going to show you guys that steak as soon as it does its little magic. Clean up our garlic little skins. So naturally part of the trend, what did you do? I remember the squid ink thing. Yeah, I know. I didn't, I never understood that. Because it didn't change the flavor. It's like they did that for color and then they fought to make it taste like regular food, which is crazy to me. I never understood that. I will never understand that. But that's what they did. It was that's cool for about five pasta. minutes. Huh? Squidding pasta? Yeah. So they and then I tried I bought some black garlic and I tried to like it. I tried to make a bunch of stuff out of it, and I just it wasn't my thing. I didn't like it. It didn't taste like garlic, and if I'm going to buy garlic, you know, I want, it, I want it to taste like garlic. So, just like before, we're going to use our, oh my god, there's still a piece of skin on there. Boo! Amateur! <laughs> so, we're going to take our garlic, and we're going to sliver it using our slicing. We can either use our slicing or our chopping, and I think for speediency, put your body in an angle. For speediency, we're going to use our chopping blade, or no, our, our slicing blade. No, our cutting blade. See, you guys got me all bothered. Slice it as thin as you're able to get it. Because we just want the oil and the flavor to work its way out into the dish. So I'm only going to do one now because I want to throw this in with the mushrooms. And kind of help them along with flavor. So we just slice those really super thin. Like I said, the knife never leaves the cutting board. It always stays against us. I use a potato peeler. To peel garlic? Huh. How could you possibly use a potato peeler to peel garlic, ma'am? The same way she uses scissors to cut vegetables. Okay, fair enough. The well, same way I assume, the same way I use scissors to cut vex vegetables. Sorry, I thought I followed you. I met you through Rex. No, no, no. That's perfectly fine. I'm glad you're in here. I appreciate it. Thank you for the follow. I really appreciate it. I'm going to call you... Exit. <laughs> Existential crisis. 
How do you like that? I'm working on my phonics, and I'm doing pretty good. I figure everybody that I pronounce their name correctly, they should at least follow me. That's fair. So existential crisis. Welcome to the, welcome to the shit show. So I'm slicing the garlic thin. Oh God, we went black. Oh man. What happened? We went black. Oh, we're back. Tex really, I think Tex started drinking early. No, I just opened up a new window. So I'm cutting these really thin. Like I said, proper nice skills. You angle yourself with the cutting board. Thank you. I slice it with razor blades. Learn from good fellows. I know, I know, that is insane. Lab, that, that part where he was doing that with the razor blade, he's just sitting there cutting the, the garlic like super paper thin. That was his thing. And he would do it for hours. That was crazy. As a chef, I just sat there and I was like, wow. I don't know the actual benefit because uh, me and razor blades never get along. I always tend to, you're holding it, you're holding the razor blade and you realize it's a double-sided blade. You know, all of a sudden you're like, hey man, where's all the blood coming from? But I use a chef knife, I keep it against the table, I got my body in an angle, and I'm just scissoring it. Whoa. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. I'm not scissoring. <laughs> I'm not scissoring the garlic. Oh my, Lanta, this is going to, this stream is going to fall right off a cliff. Not so. You didn't hear that. You didn't hear that. You did not make it into your little ears. <laughs> did it? Uh, oh, she heard it. <laughs> Great. So anyway, we're slicing <laughs> that garlic really thin. Okay, moving along, garlic, garlic, garlic. Yeah, I know. And we didn't hear that. <laughs> and we're moving along. And so I just want a little bit of garlic in with my mushrooms as they start to sweat. If you look, that camera, we gotta replace that camera. Cause I'm gonna bring it over here and show you. Do you see that? Mm, see all the mushrooms, that water that's coming off the mushrooms? That's just the liquid, that's in, the water that's inside the mushroom. The heat is extruding it or it's drying out the mushroom. Cause remember, water equals dilution. So if it's diluted, you get less flavor. The man, man the camera transitions, the transitions are so smooth. Thank you, Rex. That's not me, and you know it. That's totally Gabby over there on the ones and twos, as the kids say. So I also got a shallot. Now, a shallot is the same thing. You want to check the bottom of it, and you want to avoid any moldy or black, and you want it to be nice and dry. The shallot should be firm, and it shouldn't have any cracks in it. So you want a nice bulbous, <laughs> i got to use that word, a nice bulbous shallot okay well, we're going to chop the top off so that we can peel it and then i usually take it and i'll run the knife down around the back side of it just enough to loosen up that first layer you your verbiage tonight i know you like that bulbous i love the word bulbous oh wait i gotta save that garlic what am i drunk i don't drink so you guys can't blame me for being drunk so that's just the way it is. And it's not because I don't want to drink. It's just because I'm allergic to alcohol. So I can't drink. So that's the way it is. I know you do, James. Actually, you should just write, I drunk. Okay? Because <laughs> that's what James is. The only times James isn't a drunk is when he's asleep. And then he just doesn't know it, but he's really drunk. Hey, oh, so I'm peeling the outside. I know, Rex is always sober. Rex is sober and clean, and he's a superstar, and I don't know why he's not an MVP, because I think that's BS. Why isn't Rex an MVP? He is. Why doesn't he have the, the little... Diamond? Well, oh, I, th I didn't... What, what's, oh, the subscriber gets the Devin face. That's right. I'm yeah. sorry. <clears throat> I haven't finished yet. I might tonight. You should, James. Are you going to play with us tonight, James? I know that's not the proper verbiage. Hey, James, can you play with me? Especially since the stream is going downhill fast. Kevin, you can move it back up the hill. Oh, no, I can't. My mouth won't let me move it back up the hill. So I'm doing the same thing I did. I don't have Monster Hunter. Aww. Aren't they playing Overwatch? We're playing Overwatch, James, you, you, you wussy. Playing Overwatch. I'm sure you got that game because it's free. So we're taking our knife, we're pushing it to the cutting board, and we're slicing through the shallot. Now a shallot is for those people who don't like the overpowering flavor of garlic. 
and they don't like the overpowering flavor of onion because this is a good go between. Overwatch isn't free, Kevin. Isn't it? No. Oh, okay. I'm a damn liar now. I thought it was free. No, we bought it from GameStop like Oh, days okay. Ago. I apologize. I <laughs> apologize. I'm going to get a rush to GameStop. Give me that damn game. It's free. <laughs> The one guy who can't pronounce my name on the internet said it was free. So my mushrooms, we're going to flip those over. Like I said, we're just trying to extrude some of the water to intensify the flavor. I do not use salt when I'm extruding the water because it doesn't need it. The heat does enough work to where you don't have to worry about using salt to try and bring the water out of the mushrooms. Just be patient. Let them sit inside there and let that water come out of the mushroom. Is there a way to turn that, the brightness down on that camera? Because it's got those mushrooms just flashed out. Okay. You're going to do a camera adjustment. It just looks like, looks like we're staring into the sun. Brightness goes down. That's, that's better, right? That's better. So, shallots, is it cross between your, okay. is it cross between, um, you gotta turn it off. Oh yeah, there you go. Oh, there you go. That's moody. That's dark. That's foreboding mushrooms. I love it. Let me see, let me see my hand over there. Look. Okay, we'll take that. Okay, we're not gonna take that. Then turn the brightness up. Go, go, go. Brightness up, brightness up. That's good, yeah? Yeah, brightness down, brightness down. Let me stick my hand in it. Yeah, that'll work. We'll just bring everything back over here. So, shallot is a cross between a mushroom. Oh, what? Oh, I'm drunk. The shallot is a cross between <laughs> garlic and onion. So, if you don't like the flavor or it's too strong, go to a shallot. It's a more delicate flavor and great. And whenever you dice it up, I'm going to leave it somewhat kind of because I'm doing the mushroom and I like the idea of making bigger pieces of shallot. To have with the snake steak we're not cooking snake tonight steak and mushroom oh, i was looking for snake alfredo i know hey we're out of here I know. you guys want snake alfredo <laughs> rattle snake alfredo since we're in texas yeah that's it we're gonna rattle snake alfredo so my mushrooms are about watered out they're still you basically want to have them in the pan until they aren't sizzling anymore and they'll actually start to smell a little bit like they're burning, but they're not actually. But you just want to wait to smell them to where they're just starting. But now that we've made some room, we can push these aside. All right, we're going to push these aside, push that garlic aside. And then we're going to add more mushrooms because they shrink about half their size. Come here, little mushroom. They're going to shrink to about half their size so we can put more of our mushrooms in. So, uh, what's today? Wednesday. That's great. I'm not going to even go there. Today's Wednesday. That's all I'm saying. Welcome to Wednesday, folks. Wait, oh, look at that guy. He just He wanted to go. He jumped in the pan. He's like, take me. No, that's not right either. Oh, man. So, I'm going to put more fresh mushrooms in there. So, we can start to get the water out of those. So we just cycle through all our mushrooms that way. So we got our shallots, our shallots cut up. I it I didn't download it. Aw, lurk a bot, lurk a bit. Okay, Cherry, that's good. I can only handle one or two of you coming at me at a time. So you go lurk, go lurk. So our steak. If you look at it. It is starting to. I'll show you. I hope I can show you. But you can see. The top of it is nice and shiny. That's the water. If you look at the bottom, you can see the water coming. There's that water. It's coming off of it. That's the salt doing its job. You can't see the salt anymore because it's pretty much melted. And gravity or osmosis has forced that salt flavored water inside the steak. And remember, we've leaving this out for four hours so that it comes up to room temperature before we cook it. And then when I cook it, you're all going to blow, you're just going to be. You're going to be blown away what I do to cook a steak. i got to drink some water. Mm -hmm. 
got to stay hydrated to the stream. So, our mushrooms, our first set of mushrooms is probably done. Find me a little bowl to put my mushrooms in. As soon as I find my thingy. So, how's everyone doing? We're going to take our mushrooms out, the ones that are cooked. It's okay if we grab some of the garlic that's in there. It's perfectly fine. Um, tomorrow is Thursday. I, I don't. That means. I don't. I don't know what that means. It means I it's, either. it's Thursday. <laughs> I just felt like saying that. All right. So tomorrow's Thursday, and if we get everything done, then by Friday, we will have dessert day, and we'll be making cheesecake from scratch in the kitchen, so that you all can learn how to make a proper cheesecake. Now this recipe is really easy. There's just one major trick to it that everyone, I mean, technically it's really just cream cheese, egg, sugar. That's it. That's really the gist of a cheesecake. But everybody has problems with it cracking. Everybody probably has problems with it, like, separating. It'll get a little gritty. So I'm going to show you some little tricks to make a cheese crepe. Cheesecake. I must be drunk. Cheesecake is smooth and it usually doesn't crack. And we can soldier on so you can make cheesecakes. I love cheesecake. It's not good for you, but it's good. That's my slogan. I'm going to put that on a t shirt. It's not good for you, it's good. If it isn't good for you, it's good. Uh, it's a work in progress. Once it comes out, you'll all be like, oh, I remember when that guy said that. That drunk guy on the camera. All right, we're about halfway through our mushrooms. These are beautiful. Oh, we're still on the stove. Look at those beautiful mushrooms. Lovely. I'm just trying to extrude some of the water out of them. That's what I'm trying to do. We got our shallots. We got our mushrooms. Our chicken's still brining. Our steak's brining. We got some pasta. We're gonna put a little bed of baby spinach underneath it. You all are gonna be you're gonna be blown away how beautiful it is. So we're waiting on our steak. They said drunk with power. No, I'm not drunk with power. I'm not even drunk. I'm just, I don't know why I can't get my mouth behind my tongue today. I'm going to have a Perry tomato. Because they're delicious. Oh, I found this in the store today. This is Parmigiano Reggiano. <laughs> I got a tomato in my mouth. Hang on. Yes. Yes, we're going to make it a graham cracker cheese or crust cheesecake is what we are making Friday. It's going to take about four hours to make. I will have it done in a quick, I think it, it gets done in about two hours. But I won't, it won't be chilled. So we're probably not going to cut it. But we're going to make it. And then, or I can make one tomorrow. I say make two. Settle down. I can make two, make and then we can have one, Pull one the oven, the oven, oven, like they do on Rachel the Food Ray Network. Yeah. yeah. We're going to Rachel Ray it. So I'll make one tomorrow, and you guys won't know about it. It'll be a secret. Shh. And then Don't tell. I'll make the second one on stream, and then I'll do that, and I turn around, and I take it out, and this is what it will look like in the end. And I set it down, and it'll be sexy. And it, How's that? Deal? They don't. They just want more cheesecake. So don't act like you guys are. Don't act like you guys are supporting the stream. You just want more cheesecake. So this what? is Parmigiano. I I have problems saying this. Reggiano. Parmigiano Reggiano. Parmigiano Reggiano. We got our cheese expert today. Yeah, we do. So this was freshly um, grated today. Now you can get it in the block like this, which is what I used yesterday. Asiago cheese. That's interesting. You can use, well, any, any, and, I, and my cheese guy's here today, so I could be wrong, but I'm going to tell you that any, any cheese that's in that family of um, Parmesan, Parmigiano Reggiano, and anything in that, like your um, Asiago, anything like that is good because it's not so prominent. Yes, from a block. But if you buy this cheese that's already grated up like this, it lives for about a week, right? Yep. Yeah. If you grind it fresh, or have them grind it, if you catch it the day, they, the day that they grind it, 
This is as good as this, and it lasts a week in your refrigerator. It's still good after that. It right. just doesn't have the full flavor. Exactly. So if you do if you do skimp on the grounded grinded stuff, make sure that you talk to your cheese guy and make sure it was done within that day or that couple of days. If you want to keep it for a week, because this is a lot. So I'm going to keep this for at least a week. But yeah, in a block form, it stays dormant until you start grinding it up. But this is just as good as this. This is just more convenient. So I picked this up today to show you guys. Because this is Parmesan. And this is Parmigiano Reggiano. Reggiano. And the difference between the two is Parmesan is straight Parmesan. And this is Reggiano. <laughs> okay, there's which, more of a difference than that. What is it? Okay, so the big difference is that Parmigiano Reggiano only comes from three parts of Italy. It's aged at least two years before they re release it to the public. And it comes only in 80-ish pound wheels. That's the Reggiano? That's the Reggiano. Okay. Regular Parmesan is willy nilly loosey goosey. Can be anything as long as they think it tastes like Parmesan. Wow, see? You learned something new, kids. So if you go to a grocery store and you want to find like really authentic, straight up Parmesan, you get the Reggiano because that's they have to say that. The only way they can say that is if it was aged for two years. Two years, and it comes from three regions in Italy. Comes from three regions in Italy. So this is the top shelf stuff. This here, like you said, it could be anything as long as it tastes like Parmesan. They're going to call it. And that stuff that you get in a can, which is affectionately referred to as um, dandruff. For like the dry cans that you find over in the pasta section, you take those home and you open up the lid because it has that little plastic seal on it, and then you just dump all that in the trash. <laughs> and then you go back to the store and you get some real pecorino romano. Pecorino romano. So there's your little cheese lesson for the day. I've known uh, I've known Dana for freaking Gosh. 15 years. <laughs> And he, he works in a grocery store, and that's all he does is cheese. So every time I have cheese questions, I, I, I forward that information to him. Because that's all he does. So there you go. There's, your, there's, your, there's why you should buy the Reggiana. Now, the uh, par pecor pecor Pecorino Romano is cheese guy. Take it away. Sheep's milk cheese. There you go. It's made from sheep's milk. That's also very different. good. As long as you get the good stuff, the real stuff. Yes. If it's Pecorino Romano and it's not made from sheep's milk, it is a lie. Wow. Because Pecorino actually means it's made from sheep's milk. Oh, okay. So how, and, and what do you do to check that? You just look on it? You look in your ingredients. They have to list what's in it. Okay. So if it doesn't say sheep milk, it is not a true Pecorino. So there. That's another little cheese lesson. So I love bringing in experts. I do. See? What other stream brings in experts? <laughs> it brought you guys in an expert to talk about cheese. So if you have any cheese questions, now this now is the day to ask him, because he'll be able to answer your cheese question. So we're gonna turn the heat up a little bit because they're they're taking a little bit longer than I want them to, but they're doing what I want them to do, which is basically just sweat the water out of the mushroom, because that intensifies the flavor. I have an old school Italian market near me. Nice lab. That's awesome. That is, because we don't have anything here. I've got Dana at a grocery store, and that's it. I've got one meat market here that will usually give me what I ask for. That's it. We are in the we are in the culinary desert out here. So anytime we want something that isn't, you know, pan open or approved, <laughs> we really got to hunt for it. We have an Asian market that we're going to take you guys to, so you can see that stuff. But even the I'm going to throw someone under the bus here. Huh? We have two Asian markets. We have an Indian market, too. Do we do? Yeah, we Where do. Yeah, we got to go. It's over there off of Everhart, I think, over on the other side. It's on the right. There's a restaurant stuck to it. Oh, that's a Middle Eastern market. Still Indian. I go in there, and all, all you smell is curry. That's Indian. I live in Chicago. Oh, I love Chicago. I lived in Chicago. I lived in, um, uh, you know where this is at. Uh, Bensonville, by the airport. That's where I lived. That's where my son started school, was in Bensonville. I thought you lived in Rochelle. No, I was born and raised in Rochelle, but I lived in Chicago. And now if he lives downtown or he lives in actual Chicago, he's going to throw a stick at my face. 
because I said I lived in Chicago, but I lived in Bensonville. Because that's a suburb of Chicago. So if he isn't down by the, by the L, then he's going to lose his mind when I say that. Sure. Uh, what, what, James? James has been drinking the paint thinner again. <laughs> James, stay away from the paint thinner. Where are you at, uh, Lab? Where are you at in Chicago? Chirac. Chirac. Aw, James. Only where your people are. <laughs> you know, there's other sections of Chicago, sir. <laughs> he started it. He's the one who said my people. I'm just, I'm just validating his, his argument. Where are you at, uh, Lab? Where are you at in Chicago? <laughs> <laughs> I you know that. R. Kelly from Chicago. <laughs> I actually, I love Chicago. I don't really love the food there. Oh my gosh. Just the little sections and the food there. Go down to Navy Pier and have yourself a caramel apple. <laughs> oh man, I miss that food. What do you mean? I love me some R. Kelly. I would live, yeah, I know it. I live in the city in the Lakeview neighborhood. Okay, all right, see? So when I said I'm from Chicago, you probably immediately <laughs> unfollowed me. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> wow, James, relax. That's my hometown, my home suburb. Don't be, don't be talking stink about my home suburb. I love Chicago. I do. I was there whenever the Bulls were running through their championships, so it was chaotic every 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 time anything like that took place. It was just nasty down there. So I loved it. So yeah, welcome to my stream. I will not for never say I'm from Chicago when you're in here. I'll just say I'm from the suburbs of Chicago. Because that's a different world. Hey, at least I'm not out in, uh, oh man, what is it? Oh, I gotta remember this. It's out where all the strip malls are. Way out, I mean like way out, outside of Chicago. Help me out, where's that at? It's where all the shit, it's where the Playboy, uh, the main, well, it used to be, I don't even think it's there anymore, but the, the Playboy headquarters used to be out there, and those strip malls out towards, going towards Rockford. Because I was born and raised in Rochelle. That's where I was actually born, was in Rochelle. Jesse Smollett's from there. <laughs> James! <laughs> James! 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 So, um, back to the food. Sorry, I got sidetracked. I love talking to people from Chicago. They're my favorite people. Everybody's my favorite people. Do you cook Chicago? Did you cook in Chicago restaurants? No, I did not. I was not in the industry when I was living in Chicago. I didn't get into the industry until I moved here. And then I started to get... I got, I'm a late bloomer in the industry. I didn't really find my the excitement of cooking until I got down here. But I, there was a few documentaries about the, the chef life in Chicago. Not necessarily the executive chefs, but everyone underneath them, and it fascinated me. It really did, because they live just, they just live at the restaurant. That's their whole, their whole circle and everything about them is restaurant. And it's like it used to be before it became, you know, a commercial establishment on every corner. You can still get a mom and pop shop down in Chicago that serves amazing food. And it's ran by people that just do it. They just grind it out. And that's respectful. What life gets you down, pay someone to beat you? <laughs> James. James, 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 James. So, um, like I was saying, we're just sauteing off the, we're just trying to draw the, the water out of the mushrooms. So whenever we make our steak and mushroom Alfredo, then we'll have that nice, strong mushroom flavor. Because we got to get the water out of there. Because remember, water equals dilution. So, we try to take the water out of the mushrooms so that they dry out. Those look good. These over here look better. We're going to take our next set out of mushrooms. And I'm not going to do anything with this pan because I'm going to fire this pan up to as hot as I can get it mm -hmm. so that I can sear off or, mal or millard my steaks when they're done cooking. So, as soon as my steaks are cooked. Now I found the easiest way for any home cook to properly cook a steak. Oh, I just dropped a mushroom on the ground. I'm a terrible person. I gotta pick up my mushroom, I'm gonna step on it. 
drop the mushroom on the ground, pick that up, throw it away. So, when life gets you down, pay someone to beat you up. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. 10 second rule. No, James. There is no 10 second rule in the kitchen. There's, you, did you ever see that episode where uh, Mythbusters took that to the extreme and they did the 10 second rule? And they dropped food on the ground and then they count, uh, they did a timer and they picked it up and they did a germ test on it and it didn't matter whether it was one second. Unless you left it there, then that's the only time it actually made it. So there is no... I watch streamers like you as a guide to making restaurant dishes. Oh, that's great. That's excellent. I appreciate you coming in here and I hope that I can show you something that you can use. Like right now, my mushroom pan is gorgeous. It basically made some fawn in the bottom of the pan. I'll show it to you. This is just nice sticky fawn that I'm going to leave in the bottom of the pan so that when I sear off my steaks that I can throw. I always like to try whenever I cook a dish I always like to try and leave the remnants and then I keep adding back to it. So I'll sear my steak in here I'll finish my sauce in here so that I'm just continue building off of this fawn that I've left in the pan. I'm going to set that off the oven. Now, my steaks are about ready to cook. They're beautiful. I got me two tenderloins out of the Chateau Briand, which is the center cut of the tenderloin. So it's not off the, the lobe end and it's not off the tail end. It's right out of the middle. And that honestly, it's just for presentation and consistency and size. Because nobody wants that little tail end and the lobe is so big that it almost looks like a ribeye whenever you cut it. So this is just that center cut of the tenderloin. And we're going to preheat our oven. I know, I just said it. Preheat our oven to 225 degrees. Boop, boop. There, start. We are going to use radiant heat. Natural seasoning for the pan. Yes, James. We're going to use the radiant heat. Yes, they are fillet magnons, as I like to call them. Yeah, they're filet mignon. They're the center cut of a tenderloin. These are actually prime. So, because I wanted to, I usually cook, whatever I make on stream, my son usually eats, and I usually let the techs eat. So I try and bring the better stuff. But you can use any cut. Just don't go, don't go below um, uh, choice. I wouldn't go below choice. For sure. If you're, if you're making chili, or if you're making a beef stew, choice is great. But if you're actually making a steak, then you want to stick to natural and prime. You don't want to go below those two because no matter what you do to it, it's still going to have a texture to it that you're not going to be able to get past. So if you're making a beautiful steak on a plate with like a little bit of uh, truffle with potato and asparagus, and if you don't go prime or natural, it just doesn't have the same texture. It doesn't, it's just not, and no matter what you do to it, it's not going to be that high quality single plate, single protein. Can I be a tech? My person community would be amazing. I bet. I bet your, your person commentary would be amazing. I bet, James. I bet you and I would have fun doing this. And I mean that totally sarcastically. I thought you meant it sexually. And sexually. I meant it sarcastic, <laughs> sarcastically and sexually. <laughs> and sexually. So I took the steaks. Look at those things. Oh, uh, look at that. Wait, get the shine on there. Look at that. See, that's from putting the salt on them and leaving them on this countertop. It starts to extrude the water from the steak and then it flavors the steak on the inside so I don't have to do anything else to this. All I might do is grind a little pepper on this before I put it to the sear. But that's just it. Look at that. Oh, uh, it should have that shiny coat to it. And you can see I've already got liquid in my paper right here and here. And that's literally the salt mixing with the water on the outside and then becoming heavier and gravity forcing itself into the steak. So you always want to cook a steak at room temperature and you always want to season it with salt before you do anything and let it sit on the countertop for about four hours so that it gets to room temperature and it thoroughly absorbs <coughs> that salt. What's up? They got eaten. And I didn't eat them all. There was like nine today and they just poof. 
The cookies got poofed. So, go back to your job. Go back. My tech has wrangled herself out of her booth. So now she's free ranging it around the kitchen. So we're preheating our oven, oven to 225 degrees. What I want to do is I want to take the oven and I want to increase the internal temperature of this steak to doneness. Now 125, 135 is where I'm trying to get to on the internal temperature of the steak. I can put the steak in a pan and I can sear it off. Okay, but the problem with that is I've already overcooked the outside medium well. Calm down, James. But by the time I get the inside to the temperature I want, which is what James would like, which is 145 to 155, then the steak has already overcooked on the outside. So I want to get the internal temperature of the steak where I want it. Yeah, that was Gabby. She's walking around. She's looking for something to snack on. So, um... I want the internal temperature to reach my doneness. Okay, so I'm going to put it in the oven and let radiant heat slowly bring the temperature of the steak up and not affect the outside of the steak because I don't want to put this in a pan and sear the crap out of it. And then whenever I take it out for the internal temperature to reach that doneness stage, you've already abused the outside of the steak. So all I want is that simple layer of um, Millard effect on the outside. And then I want the rest of the meat to be the same temperature all the way through. So that you have a nice crust. And then the rest of the steak has the internal, exact same internal temperature. And the only way you can do that is one sous vide, which is put it in a Ziploc bag and put it into a bath water as set to the temperature that you want the steak to do. Or you do it this way, which is put it, bring it to room temperature, put it on a pan, stick it in a 225 degree oven, and just slowly wait. It will gradually, and it won't even brown the outside of the steak. The outside of the steak will just be a dark red. And then you put it in a boiling hot pan and you sear the crap out of it to get the right effect. That's how a lot of restaurants do their steaks because it's easier because they can bring a whole steak up to a holding temperature and then hold, hold it and then cut it off and sear it. So this is what I'm doing with these steaks. So I got me a little sheet pan because we're going to use indirect heat to cook it and then we'll use direct heat to color it because that becomes a general theme whenever you do cooking is you use indirect heat or oven to actually cook the product and then you use direct heat to color it so fried chicken steak i want gelato me and james are going to have gelato at a french cafe and and wherever I think he's in, where are you at, James? Are you in, are you in like Georgia or somewhere? I assume or Tennessee or I know you're east of me. If you say California, I would be like, well, but I swear you're east of Pennsylvania. I know you're east of me. I've been to Pennsylvania once, and I stayed there for about five minutes, and I loved it. It's very beautiful up there. I know you thought I was gonna talk shit, but I wasn't. So my oven is up to temperature, 225 degrees. We're going to stick our brine steak in there. And then amongst all the other pans I have in here, let's move all those pans. I didn't realize it was a storage closet. I thought it was an oven. We put our two, and we're going to set a 15 minute timer. Timer, 15 minutes. Because all we're trying to do is see where that steak's at, and we're checking it every 15 minutes. <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> no. So me and James are going to have a gelato in Pennsylvania at a French cafe, and we're going to talk about life and everything. I promised him, someday. It might be over Skype, but still, it'll mean the same. All right, so now we're going to work on our bechamel so that we have a bechamel sauce to turn into an Alfredo sauce. So I get my handy dandy pan. And like last week, or the week before, whoo, the week before, we're going to make a bechamel, which is simply butter. I've got a quarter pound of butter here. And I don't, I'm not big about 
exact measurements unless I'm using a scale. And until we get into baking, I'm not going to even bring scales into it because I don't want to. I don't want to make it more complex than it already is. So I'm trying to teach by smell and by feel and by sight and kind of let everyone know that when you're cooking, if you're just calm about it and you just enjoy it, then the food will pretty much take care of itself. You just have to be manageable when it comes to the what you're doing. So I got my butter in my pan. Turn my pan on. Now medium low because I don't want to cook the butter. All I want to do is bring it up to where the butter melts and then it's warm enough to accept the flour. So we're taking our flour. Uh -huh. Tell me when you want to switch the stove, because you walk back and forth. I know, I'm a ninja. Rex complimented you for your, your camera skills, and you're switching up, so let's keep Rex happy. <laughs> Alright, I'll just constantly switch camera views. Yeah, make him throw up. That's a great idea. Aren't you, aren't you, aren't <laughs> you bechamel covered? Yes, I am bechamel covered. I am the same color as bechamel. And you are a, a spignol. You are a espignol rule, rue. So we're melting our butter. We got our flour, handy dandy flour. We get a little bowl. Put our flour in. Today's Wednesday. I don't speak snappish. <laughs> espignol, not espignol. Espignol. Okay. There's a difference. Espignol is a made-up word. The, um, the time, whenever espignol was invented, they basically took the Spanish migrants that were cooking for a, um, I want to say, it wasn't a king. It was a, uh, uh, I want to say it was like, it was, a, it was an important person. It was like royalty, but it wasn't a king. So anyway, he, uh, his servants were going to make a sauce, or he told the servants to make a sauce. The servants were Spanish. So they came up with this, they basically took a dark roux and they added tomato to it. So whenever they added the tomato to it, then they served it and the, uh, the people loved it. And it became a thing and they named it after the servants in celebration for their culture. So they named it Espignol, which is not a real word. It's just basically what they thought it should be called because Spanish people made it. So I always find that word to be funny. Espignol. It's like a French person speaking Spanish, which that's why I find it funny. So, if my tech would look that up, I would know if it was a dip, dip, or a debutante. It was just somebody important, but it wasn't a king. It's just the meaning of Espignol on the internets. You will give, oh my god, I started to read Nightbot again. Me and Night, me and Nightbot are just, we're best friends. So, Melting my butter, looking good. Uh, like I said, tomorrow, I don't know if we're going to leave pasta yet or not. We might. And if we don't, we're probably going to make a, uh, a uh, stuffed pasta with a red sauce. Because we're making our bechamel today. And I want to do pasta one more day just to show it. Because we basically have done main dishes with a pasta side. But I really want to do a dish that's a pasta main. We could do lasagna. We could do a uh, a uh, the what is it called? I lost my mind. Oh, which one? Stuffed pasta. Uh, I don't know why manicotti? I think it's manicotti, chicken marsala. We could. Well, we made shrimp marsala. No, we didn't. We didn't make shrimp. We made piccata. shrimp piccata. We could make chicken marsala if that's what you want. That would be fun. I would like that. I mean, I'm going to kind of leave it up to you guys. I'll tell you what. Whoever's in the room, whoever's in the stream, you tell me what you want me to make tomorrow, and that's what we'll make, okay? So, so far, I got one vote for chicken masala. Now, I'm waiting on the other people. So, my butter is melted. It's just starting to simmer a little bit. So, I'm going to start adding my flour to it. Now, what I want to do, it needs to be a little warmer. I'm going to leave that flour in there. I don't want to quite do it. Just yet. Yes, James, you get one vote. One vote for chicken masala. 
So far, that's my only vote. So right now, it's chicken marsala. So we're going to take and we're going to stir it around, wait for our butter to get a little bit hotter, because we're just going to make a blonde roux for our bechamel sauce. And the difference between like a bechamel and a velouté and an espagnole, well, yeah, an espagnole, they use oil. So they'll use like vegetable oil to make the espagnole and the velouté, whereas a bechamel, they use butter because they want to include the fat, the milk fat, so that it makes it even creamier. So we want it to start to bubble like that a little bit. We're going to sprinkle in a little bit more flour. And never rush a roux. I, there's nothing more important about making a standard roux than realize that you don't want to force the flavor out of the flour. So you allow it to come up and, and bloom. You want this to be complex and you have to give the flour time to actually come and toast. It's just like, you know, putting toast in a toaster. It takes a little time for the elements to heat up. And it takes a little bit of time. You can take a blowtorch to toast, but by the time you're done with it, it's burnt on the outside and it's raw in the middle. Well, if you look at flour the same way, if you don't let this roux do what it's going to do, it's going to be burnt on the outside and it's going to taste like burnt flour. So you have to let this roux take its time and slowly come to color. That's super important when it comes to roux. And there are so many, there's so much complexity to making a roux, but the standard thing is never rush a roux. Allow it to do what it's going to do in its time. And a really good, good dark roux is probably going to take about 20 minutes of stirring. Just, like I said, once I get my consistency right, which is pretty close right here, I just want a little bit more flour. Then I'm going to sit there and slowly stir it. I'm going to cook my roux, but you have to be patient with it. But that's the nice thing about it is I can make this and I can put it in a jar inside a refrigerator. Once it cools down, I can dump off the excess, excess oil. Okay, act up. Thank you. Uh, that's two for chicken masala. Thanks for showing up. The Spanish cooks of Louis the the thirteenth. His bride, of Louis XIII's bride, Anne, helped to prepare the wedding feast and instead upon improving the rich brown sauce of France, which they insisted, they insisted on improving the, the rich brown sauce of France, France with, with Spanish, Spanish tomatoes. tomatoes. <laughs> this new sauce was an instant success and was gradually named in honor of its creators. So it was the wife of the king. I apologize. But I knew it wasn't the king. But Louis the Thirteenth, his wife Anne, was preparing the banquet, and they're like, "Let's put the mayo into the rich brown sauce," and that's how balute came about. No, espagnol. Mm -hmm. I'm just throwing it around here. That's all I'm doing. So if you look on the, yeah, no, they can't see nothing. Well, I know what I'm replacing. I'll bring it over here. If you look at this, you see how it looks like it's just congealed just a little bit. You see how it slowly starts to slide back together like kinetic sand? So I just want it to that consistency because I'm making a bechamel. But once I make this, I only use what I need for the bechamel. And I could put the rest in a small jar, put it in my refrigerator, and keep it for up to a week in the refrigerator. And then I have a, and then I have a roux all the time to use for thickening. Kitchen Cacciatore with polenta. Okay, there's a vote. Josh has got us with kitchen or chicken cacciatore with polenta. I love polenta. Dana said beef Wellington, but I was just kidding. Wow, Dana. Dana's <laughs> swinging for the fences. <laughs> it's going to be mock beef Wellington. So it's oh, going to have man. like, it's just not going to have anything inside. <laughs> it's just going to be Wellington. Oh, I, love I made grilled polenta cakes last. I love, Josh, you are right on. I love polenta. I do. And that's the, that's the best thing is you sit there and you mix it. It's basically like uh, corn mash. And then you make it and then you sit there and it, it, will, it will congeal on its own. And it's like little rubbery, uh, like pieces of rubbery cornbread. And then you put that in a hot pan with a little bit of oil and some red pepper flake and you roast it. Or you basically fry it. You fry it on both sides and it gets really crispy. And then it's creamy on the inside. And they make great sides. 
It really does. That's a primarily, if I'm not mistaken, it's a French dish. I believe polenta is French. Italian? Italian? Uh, we're going to have to look it up. It's either French or Italian. I know it's European. So give me those numbers. French or Italian. Polenta? Polenta. Because down here people think polenta is Spanish. And that's why I'm saying that I believe that it is... Josh saying it's Italy. I got two to one. Polenta. Help me out, guys. Working. Polenta. We're using the internet to find out where polenta is from. But it's basically a corn mash. Italian. Okay. I was wrong. It's Italian. So, yeah, it's great. It, it makes a great... It's a great, okay, we got three votes for Masala. So, all right. Hey, XX, welcome to the chat. So we're making chicken masala because there are nine people in the room. I've only got three votes for one dish. I think three other people have voted for something else. So right now we're making chicken masala. Waiting on those second, those other votes. So James, you're in the lead. We're making chicken masala. To be to, to be honest, I took my family phone and voted. Wow! Oh, James! So James! We have, we have one vote. James has been kicked out of the voting. <laughs> <laughs> We're not making chicken masala. I know, and then he rigged the boat. <laughs> rigged the dang boat. Wow. Now I knew. Now, see, now I think you live in Florida. Oh, Florida voting jokes. How topical. <laughs> but hey, I got you two followers. Hey, that's true. I appreciate it, James. We're making chicken marsala tomorrow. What was it? Chicken marsala and what? What were we making with that? You said something to go with it. Didn't he? Or am I insane? No, I don't think so. I think you did. Come on, he got. The Tori had to let them. Huh? Chicken marsala was just. No, it was above that. You said to make something with it, I thought. All right, there. We got a nice blonde, nice blonde roux. I'm looking at the entire chat. She's on the oven waiting for her to come back to the cutting board. Fell asleep on me. Nice blonde roux. It's a little thinner, but that's okay because we're making a bechamel. We're adding cheese. We're adding the Alfredo to it. So I don't want to make it like a standard super thick bechamel because I actually want to use most of this in the... Uh, Alfredo sauce, so I like it. It's a good match right there. I love it. <coughs> I might let it dry out a little bit more. I would turn my heat down a little bit. <coughs> we got 46 seconds on our steak, so we'll check that. In 46 seconds, and then we'll start to dry out our chicken. Because I think it has been, how long has my chicken been in? In the brine. It's got to be hour, not, it has been an hour. hour. <coughs> I don't think it's been an hour. Hour, yeah, because we've been shooting for almost an hour and a half. Okay, yeah, so it's been in there about an hour. That's good. That's good right there. We're going to take that off. No, wait, no, we're not. We're going to actually, we're going to go ahead. <coughs> yeah, we're not. Because I want to use the pan to make it. So we're going to put our bechamel. Brew aside, we're going to take our therm thermal couple thermometer to check the temperature of our steaks, <coughs> as timing permits. Thank you guys for engaging me in chat. I really appreciate it. So here's our steaks. As you look, we've been in the oven for 225 degree oven for 15 minutes. So we're going to check the internal temperature of our steak, and right now we're at right around 95 degrees. So we got to probably we're going to stick them in for another 15 minutes. I always do everything. I, every time I cook, I do an increment of 15 minutes. Timer, 15 minutes, because it helps me keep track of everything. So if I'm doing it in 15 minutes, usually nothing will get away from me. 
if I'm doing it every 15 minutes. So I like to always use a, a timer, divide it by 15 minutes. So if I need a half hour, 45 minutes, hour, it just keeps me, keeps my mind focused on all the food that's going on at the same time. So I'm going to start my pasta wata, which is pasta. And this is another, this is one of those things where I'm going to use the, I made fresh pasta the other day, but a lot of people don't want to commit to the price and the effort it is to make fresh pasta. Mm -hmm. So we're using the grocery store fresh pasta. We can also use the dry fresh pasta or the dry pasta, which is made with semolina flour, which is a wheat flour. And this stuff here is, um, it's as close to fresh homemade pasta as you're going to get without making it yourself. And um, yeah, this is durum. This is a durum wheat with egg flour. So this is as close. Oh man, I miss real pasta. I know. We made some the other day and um, it turned out great. And the nice thing about the store-bought stuff is, like I said, it's as close you can get to real pasta, but it's... Um, you can't beat homemade pasta, which I, I demonstrated that the other day. It's basically an, one egg, or one cup of flour, and one tablespoon of cold water. You mix that together, and then I have a KitchenAid attachment that will string it all out and then cut it into the fettuccine. But for us today, we're going to use this for our dinner. So we're bringing the water up to cook this, and I don't think, eh, it'll be close. I think I have enough water in there to cook everything. Let us hope. So right now we're pretty much waiting on our steak. So I've got my shallots. I've got my chicken, which I'm going to start drying that out. Because we're going to do the same thing. I always like to use a separate cutting board so that I don't contaminate my cutting board area when I start playing with my chicken. So I got myself a sheet pan. And I got myself some paper towels. I'm going to lay out my chicken on my paper towels because right now I just want to dry them off. Now, now we could do with our, our chicken, because really we just have boneless, skinless chicken breast. So to make chicken alfredo with mushrooms, we're going to lay out our brine chicken. Now remember the sat in that salt water, brown sugar, and um, water. Or not salt water. Yeah, well, kosher salt, brown sugar, and water for about an hour. And that's really, I mean, realistically, that's all, all the time you really need to have it sit in there. So I saw a need. I want to learn to make wheat-free alternatives. Yes, wheat-free alternative pasta is it's one of those things where if you get the xanthier, what is it, xanthier powder? Xanthian gum. Xanthian gum. And you mix that in with the, the non-wheat flour or a gluten-free flour. It will make pasta, it's, but you got to have that. you got to have that binder. Because that's the biggest Achilles heel to having a, a gluten-free anything is you're missing the binder that comes with the flour, the gluten that holds everything together. So you have to have the xanthier gum to make sure everything sticks together. And they used, it, they used to not sell that stuff. But now, lately, bigger grocery store chains have started bringing that in all by itself. So you can add it to the flowers, so you can make all types of regular, normal, gluten-free things. Do 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 do. Sodium xanthium gum, okay. I'll check it out. See if I can make it. I have celiac. Yeah, if you have celiac, then absolutely. And that's your go-to. That xanthium gum is 100% go-to. <coughs> Can't handle. What can't Dana handle? Oh. What can you not handle, Dana? Uh, it's no not problem, that. James. Josh, no problem at all. It was autocorrect. Oh. Can't handle. <laughs> wow, that's a big autocorrect. I know. It went from xanthian gum, xanthian gum to can't handle. See, if you can't handle gluten, you have to use xanthian gum. So yeah, that's your binder. That's that's everything that you see that's gluten free that doesn't look like a cement brick has the anthier gum in it. So my chicken, it's pretty good, nice and pretty. I'm gonna I'm gonna basically sear off my steaks, and then I'm going to to um, sear off my chicken, 
because the pan's going to be boiling hot. I don't want to put this chicken in it because the outside of chicken skin is really super delicate and you'll change the texture and you'll dry it out and it will become gum gummy. So I just want to color the outside of this chicken whenever I put it in the pan and then I'm going to stick it in the oven to cook it. So I don't want to over tax the outside mm -hmm. of the... Hey Mr. Plains, we're making steak and mushroom alfredo. We've already got our steaks in the oven. We've got our roux made for our bechamel. We've got our fawn in our pan from our mushrooms. We're starting to boil the pasta water. We just took the chicken out because I'm going to make some sub chicken parmesan or chicken alfredo for the people that don't get the steak alfredo with mushrooms. One person in the house doesn't like mushrooms. She doesn't like vegetables. I'm trying to kick her out in the yard, but she won't go. <laughs> Who doesn't like vegetables? Come on. So we're making chicken alfredo, or chicken alfredo, steak alfredo with mushrooms. And then um, right now we're about midway. So thank you for coming in, Mr. Plains. I hope you can stick around and watch this come together. And I also got some baby spinach. And I got some small tomatoes for decorative. We're going to put the baby spinach. On. You'll see. It's going to be beautiful. I want to be like you on Twitch lessons. Mm -hmm. I, I get no love. Aw, Rex. I love you. <laughs> in a purely, it's a purely physical way. But I still love you. I'm going to go hang out with you. I always try and hang out with you. Rex, you get love. You actually brought me love. So I don't want to hear your crap. Because Rex, you're a superhero. You're VIP, buddy. You're VIP. So I don't want to hear it. Or you're VIB. <laughs> I'll let that soak in for a second. So right now I'm going to add a little bit more water to my pasta. <laughs> Because it does cook fast, but I'm using two of those containers, and I don't... I always like to have... Come in Spanish. I always like to... I always like to have more water than pasta, because whatever pasta you're making is going to release starch and gluten. And when it does that, it makes the water all gummy. You have to let that water... You have to let that water wash your pasta as it cooks it. So you don't get that sticky, sticky pasta. Just use more water. The more water you have and you cook the pasta in it, it dilutes that so whenever you pull it out after two seconds it doesn't turn into a giant sticky glob of pasta. Always add a lot of water to your pasta pot when you're boiling the pasta. Mm. So, <laughs> James, don't cry in Spanish. <laughs> I don't even know what that sounds like. So, remember that when you're making pasta, whether it be the semolina dried pasta or if you make homemade pasta or like we bought the store-bought store fresh pasta, Use a lot of water in your pot to cook the pasta so that it dilutes all the stuff coming off the pasta. Like I said, it kind of washes it while it cooks it so that it doesn't go whack whenever it starts to... The minute you take it out of the pan, you know what I'm talking about. And everything starts to stick together and then it becomes one giant glob. Which, I'll show you what to do about that. It's pretty simple. You just take a little half a cup of water and dump it on the pasta and flip it around and it will release all of that starch and gluten that's coming out of the flour. So I'm waiting on that, waiting on that, I'm waiting on that. I got my spinach, I got my tomatoes. Let's cut up a couple of tomatoes for our display because we're going to make a pretty dish. You like my new, you like my new table camera? Yeah, 1080p, buddy. The last one looked like I was in a prison. So I got this beautiful, you can see the pinkness of my skin and the redness of my tomatoes. And it gives you a better view of what you're looking at. It's not all murky and scary. So, we're going to use the slicing edge of our knife. They're red. They're pink, James. Don't be, don't be that way. So, we're going to use the slicing edge of our knife. And this part of the knife is the slicing edge. Remember this. This is important. The chef knife has a slicing edge, has a cutting edge, and has a chopping edge. Each of those edges do their jobs. That's why chef's knives are pretty much universal. And they do a lot of the heavy lifting is your chef knife. There's your slicing, your, your cutting, and your chopping. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slice through the tomato. I'm going to hold it like this. Remember I have my body at an angle to the cutting board. I'm going to push the knife down until it touches the cutting board. Because a stable knife is a safe knife. And then I'm just going to use my slicing blade to slice through the tomato. Alright? You're red. I'm pink, Rex. I'm pink. 
I'm not red, I'm pink. You got those Santa Claus cheeks. Yeah, I got those Santa Claus cheeks. Gabby's giving me shit. So down to the cutting board and then pull through, okay? That's your slicing blade of your knife. That's all you use that for, that motion right there. You, you learn basically three cuts. You're slicing, you're um, cutting, and you're chopping. But this one is a slicing cut. Then if I wanted to chop this tomato in half, or cut this tomato in half, I would start my knife in, and as soon as I reach the cutting board, I would use this part of the knife, which is the middle, which is my cutting blade, and that's how I would cut my tomato. But I want to slice them so I go in, pull towards me. That's a slice. Make these pretty red tomatoes. Red is my cheeks. Pink is my hands. Because you guys are jerks. So we're cutting up our tomatoes. Pretty, pretty, pretty. Pretty tomatoes. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So uh, be right back, board games tonight. Oh, that's cool, James. James is a good guy. I know I give him crap, but he's a good guy. I give him, a, on a scale, I give him 14 bananas. That's how good of a guy he is. He is 14 bananas, so guys. ask him out of what, because he'll just say it's 14 bananas. It's 14 bananas. That's how much James is worth. 14, other than being a Chad cheater. Is that something the kids say? Because I don't know what that means. What is a Chad cheater? Florida Lotto. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, that's true. Because <laughs> that's right. He, oh, that's right. He broke up the. He broke up tomorrow's requested dish election. That's right. I think we should bring in the uh, federal government and have a recount. I think it's only fair. Yeah, that's right, Josh. He did do that. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> Marcella is good, but it's kind of boring. Aw, you hear that? <clears throat> hear that, James? Josh just thinks that Marsala is boring. Well, let's do something that it doesn't make it boring. We'll find something to do to it. Maybe we'll just make a dish. Because really, realistically, James not here right now. He's playing board games. We'll make it whatever we want, and we'll just call it, Hey, James, this is the real true <laughs> chicken Marsala. <laughs> He's like, that's got beef in it. Yeah, I know. It's chicken Marsala. <laughs> What do you think Marcella means? Huh? What do you think Marcella means? What do I think Marcella no. means? Yeah, okay. ask him. Ask, Marcella. Yeah. It means beef. We'll just ask him what it means. And then it'll be all thrown off. It's just on every menu. That's true. But that's what James picked and that's what they elected. Who am I to who am I to argue? With the fan base. So I cut up all my tomatoes. I've eaten two of them. Mm. I love tomatoes. Probably my favorite fruit is a tomato. You like how I did that? Because that's right, tomatoes are fruit. It's my favorite fruit. What is that saying? Knowledge is knowing tomatoes are fruit, but wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. <laughs> right. That is true. So we got our mushrooms, beautifully cooked. And all those mushrooms I chopped up fit, chopped up. All those mushrooms I chopped and reduced fit in this little bowl. I think that's pretty cool. Because mushrooms are mostly water. So when we start extruding all that water, we end up with nice, condensed, flavored, strong flavored mushrooms. They'll carry their own weight through the whole dish. And that's really what's important. I don't want them releasing the water into my bechamel because that'll make my bechamel runny. And it'll also kind of knock the flavor out of it. So I want everything to be as strong and condensed as possible so that the flavor's there. So that's why I always reduce, I always try and dry out my mushrooms and no matter what I do, even if I make mushroom soup, I will take my mushrooms and I'll put them in, in the pan prior to making the mushroom soup and let all that water get out of there because that just intensifies the flavor because water equals dilution. So our water to our pasta is boiling. We're still waiting and we got 23 seconds on our steak and I think they'll be ready. So we're probably going to start our pan. Now I don't want to burn that fawn that's in the bottom of the pan. Wait on six seconds, five, four, take my probe, check my chicken, 
take my chicken. See where we're at temperature wise. It's starting to release water, not a lot, but enough to where I'm probably right where. Oh, that's beautiful. <clears throat> we're at one. We're at 115. Yeah, we're at 115. So right now we're at rare, rare. Oh, thank you, King. Woo! See that? A tier one subscriber. We just got a subscriber. Oh, thank thank you. you so much. I really appreciate it, King. Yeah, we don't even have a. We don't even know what to do when somebody subscribes. We're just like, uh. <laughs> Thanks. No, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm glad you've been enjoying the food. I'm gonna add a probably a eight minute timer because it's just right there. I want a little more cook. It was rare, rare, so I want a little bit closer because remember, we're going to make this and then we're going to sear the crap out of these steaks, put the pasta together, and then we're going to thin slice the steak and lay it over the top. So I want that color in the middle to be perfect. So I've got to push them a little bit harder because once the searing happens, then I'm just going to throw them back in my 200 degree oven because they're not going to do anything more than what they've already done. So we're going to sear them, throw them back in the 200 degree oven while we finish everything else up. And then, oh my god, why didn't you tell me I have my bond pan on? You guys are assholes. So we're going to take our, our brew. Now, one of the people in the house hates mushrooms. So we're going to sneak a little mushroom flavor into it. And I guarantee you should not be going to know the difference. So we're going to take some of our brew. I'm just restoring it to kind of bring it back together. We're going to put it in this pan. Probably that much. To start, I've got a little roux left in case I need it. I'm gonna crack a little black pepper. Are we on this camera? I want to crack a little back black pepper on the outside where the pan is still bare, because I want to bloom this black pepper a little bit. So we're gonna crack that black pepper on the bare part of the pan, and we're gonna move it over to the heat so that it will start to bloom that black pepper. These are complex words that are getting stuck in my mouth, so. I hope you guys appreciate it. Thank you so much for that subscription. That really, that means a lot to us. Like I said, we've only been doing this just over two weeks, and we're really trying hard. And, um, hey, Mr. Plains, how's it going right now? I've got a subscriber. Boing. But I'm really, I'm really super excited about doing this. And like I said, we're new at this. And I know we're not. Like, I know that we just do food and we just do cooking, but I, I really want to make this something special for everybody so that when you come in here, you know you not only get to watch and be entertained, but you learn something. If you walk away with this going, I remember something he said, and then you start taking that over into your own food, then I've, I've done what I needed to do, and I really super appreciate it. I really do. Because that lets me know that I'm not just running around the kitchen like a crazy person. But I'm actually doing something that you guys are enjoying. So thank you so much for that. Uh, that's my speech. And I'm sticking to it. So I can start to smell that black pepper that I put in there. So I'm going to add a little bechamel. Or no, I'm not. I'm not adding bechamel. I'm adding heavy cream. Yes, Mr. Plains, that's correct. So heavy cream. Heavy cream. Wait on tech. Well, that's okay. I'm proud of my boy. I remember when you first strolled through with the Twitch, and now you're big as hell. Well, I appreciate that, James. I really <laughs> didn't <laughs> turn Hollywood on us. The next stream, I'm doing in sunglasses. No, I'm not. Because I have a square head, and they look horrible on me. So, heavy cream and milk. Because some people make bechamel with milk, and some people make it with heavy cream. Some people make it with natural cream. Some people make it 2% milk. The difference between those things is 2% milk means there's 2% milk fat. Everything else is basically water. So you get 2% milk fat and water. And the next skim milk is just white water. There's no reason to have skim milk in your house. Not even for coffee. You might as well just dump water in there. It's nothing. It's just water. Skim milk has no milk fat. Zero. I think it's like 0.5 to be called. 
and then heavy cream or regular whole milk only has four to six percent milk fat so you're still dealing with 93 to 96 percent water so every time you make a bechamel or every time you make a sauce i use heavy cream because that has anywhere from it has like 14 to 18 percent milk fat so there's substantially more milk fat and heavy cream and you can whip this into dessert stuff so it's it's pretty much uh, you can't turn this into milk but and you can't turn milk into heavy cream but if you're going to use this to make gravies or sauces or anything like that go with the heavy cream don't use milk you're just fighting the water because you eventually have to get that water out of there for it to work or you have to use a ton of roux to cover up all the water so yeah, I know. I <laughs> already new text. Get out! No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I want to. I always use heavy cream whenever I make any type of gravy or bechamel because it's just easier to to use. Listen to this. Listen to this. Listen to this. Uh, so I slightly scorched my heavy cream. Oh, that smells good. Now I want to make this thin because remember, cheese is a coagulant. No, coagulant. Yeah, that's the word I was looking for. <gasps> Did somebody see what I've been doing? You guys Using a copy. metal whisk on a nonstick pan? Shut up. Blasphema! That's a big no-no. I know. So I got caught using a metal whisk in a nonstick pan. I'm going to be beat. I'm going to them, I'm gonna have to give them two portions so they shade it. Mmm, I love all that Teflon cream. I know. <laughs> I didn't scrape it that hard. You shut up. <laughs> You're supposed to support me. So I've got more heavy cream. Yay. Did you see it's bubbling like that? That's what you want. It slightly scorches the heavy cream. Any good gravy, you have a scorched milk or a scorched milk fat in it. So same thing for bechamel. If you ever go like down south, southern United States, and you go into an authentic like southern restaurant, and you ask the 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 lady, the giant lady that's behind the counter that makes the gravy and biscuits, she will tell you that scorching the milk is the most important thing when it comes to the flavor of gravy. You've got to scorch that milk. can't burn it, but you've got to scorch it. So it's super important to hear that initial sizzle when you put that in there. So I want to get that roux nice and hot. I, um, I, uh, what did I do? Oh, I bloomed the pepper. So it's got a nice strong pepper kick to it because you don't need a lot of it if you bloom it first. So I always like to crack the pepper into the blank side of the pan or before I put the roux in, I'll crack pepper in there, leave it for a few seconds. So it brings the oil out of those peppercorns so that it makes a nice strong. Now right now it's a little lumpy and that's because the heat in the heavy cream hasn't matched the heat in the roux. So it starts to immediately start to come apart. But if you just sit there and patiently stir it in, it will come back to a beautiful, silky smooth. Silky smooth. And you notice I'm adding a little bit at a time. I don't want to add a lot to it because I just don't want to sit there and have to fight it to get it back up to temperature. I allow it to do what it's doing, coming back up to temperature. So this is a, a specific bechamel. So I'm, I'm kind of flavoring it as such. I put a little pepper in there and a normal bechamel is just roux and milk and butter or roux and milk really that's the normal one and then the French started to play around with it and they were doing like sauteed uh, shallots in it and they were doing all this goofy stuff and sometimes French put a shot of nutmeg on top of it so that's great but we're trying to do a, an Italian chicken alfredo so I want to keep my seasoning kind of bland and basic there's my steak so I'm gonna let this sit here turn the flame down just a little bit because I don't want to chase it as long as you see those random little bubbles on top of it, I know. Then you just have to trust me that there's random little bubbles on top of it. So there's our steak. If you notice, we're going to stick our probe in there. We're at 125 degrees in that steak. We're at 125 degrees in that steak. So both these steaks are about where I want them. And if you notice, because I slow brought that temperature up, in the oven that they're still very pink on the outside they're still they're cooked all the way through but they got a nice pinkness to the outside of them so that when I go to get the Millard effect I don't have to fight through oil because all the oil that's in the pan is gonna be super hot 
and it's going to crisp the crap out of the top of these steaks. So I'm super excited about that. So we're going to put those aside and we're going to go back to our roux, our bechamel sauce. So we shut our oven off. Wait, no, we're just going to stop our timer. I'm going to bring the oven down to 170 to hold my steaks once I sear them for plating. So we're going to bring that, because usually an oven like this will only go down to 170. Most ovens in your house only go down to 170 degrees. So I just put it at its lowest temperature. Because I really don't want that steak to do any more than it's already doing. I don't want it to cook more. I think to cut my bechamel down just a little more, I'm going to add a touch of um, milk. Just to break it down a little bit. Because once I start adding that cheese, it'll start thickening back up again. So I want it to be a little thinner. And if I kept adding heavy cream to it, that's too much milk fat and it just won't thin out like I want it to. So I always finish with milk if needed. Now if I need to make a lot of this, I could have kept adding the heavy cream to it. But I want it to be nice and thin and then I'll start gradually adding the Parmesan cheese to it. But your sauce should look like, I know you guys can't see it, that camera is blown out. Here, let me try something. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't work. Uh, didn't pay my electric bill. Try turning on the uh, kitchen light. Yeah. I don't think that'll work. But we'll try it. And, and now, now turn off this. Like, yeah. Alright, let's try this. No. Uh, it's about the same. No, yeah. it didn't do anything. We'll still get that. I think we just need to get a different camera for the stove. It's just too flashed out. But I'll bring it over here. So, this is what it should look like. It's nice and it has a thickness to it. It sits on the spoon really nicely. Okay, a little bit runny, which is exactly what I want. So we're cool there. So that's a nice bechamel that I can add my Parmigiana Riani on. So Parmigiana Riani on cheese too, to make my bechamel or to make my Alfredo. So we're taking our Parmigiano Reggiano cheese. Uh, there you, uh, go. There you like go. that? And we're going to start slowly sprinkling that in to our sun bleached sauce on the stove. Because for some reason, that part of the tech part didn't make it. So, we're going to stir that into the sauce. And I'm not really, I, I truly believe the amount of heat that I have in the sauce already is enough to melt this cheese. So all I'm going to do with it now, because I have to make room for my steak and chicken, so I'm going to take this, I'm going to stir the cheese in so that it's covered pretty much, move it around a little bit, and then I'm going to transfer it to a bowl, because I have to cook off my other stuff. So bowl, bowl, and we will take it, and we will take the, the cutting board. Take this, put it in, look at that, oh, look at the bechamel, it is so beautiful. Can I taste it? Yeah, of course you can. And you notice I still haven't put salt in this. Yeah, the only time I, not even need to. The only time I put salt in this is at the very end, and that's just to create a contrast in flavor. So I really don't need any salt. And that's got a little bit of mushrooms in it, so you can shh, so the girl who doesn't like mushrooms will be stuck eating mushrooms and she won't even know it. So right now I want to take my pan. I want to turn it on. I've got my handy dandy olive oil squirter. Look at that. Fancy. So all I'm going to do is color this. I'm going to color the chicken outside and then I'm going to put it in the oven to cook it. Which I can't use an oven. What? Mm -hmm. i got to bring my oven up to 350 degrees. Then i got to cook the chicken. Two. Right. There we go. All right. All right. Bring it up. What? You hungry? No. What's wrong? Nothing. Something. Everything. Everything. So there's my bechamel. You know she's not on the cutting board. I'm losing her. I'm gonna taste it. Mmm. That's really good. Cheese. Settle down. 
Wait, Plus, you only need about half as much of that kind of cheese as you would of the domestic Parmesan's. Oh, the, the, the flavor. The intensity. Yeah. Fair enough. Let's get the text to try this. I'm probably going to, I don't know yet because I think it needs to be thinned out and have a little more cheese added to it, but keep your spoons. Keep your spoons. Oh, that is so good. I'll put that aside. Steaks, waiting for this to warm up. I want it to be at about a <laughs> sitcom cheer, so whenever you put it in the put the chicken in there, it should sound like a sitcom cheering, not a golf clap <laughs> or a rock concert. You know, people like that actually. Oh, you're doing sitcom cheer. <laughs> Shut up. So, while well, he rudely interrupted me with his imitation Sorry. of a sitcom. <laughs> Sorry. So, we're gonna take our chicken. We're just listen. Ooh. All we're doing is color out the outside. You're not really going to affect the outside of the chicken. As long as you don't put massive heat to it, we're just trying to kind of color the outside. Because whenever you have, oh, that's too hot. Now it's starting to get a little too noisy for me. Definitely hot. So I'm going to turn that down a little bit. I'm going to move it off the heat. I really don't want to attach that chicken breast. So all I want to do is slightly start to color it. See there, that's better sound. Now I'm going to move back on the heat. So if you're doing that and the pan is making too much noise, you simply slide it off the heat for a few seconds and you'll hear that oil start to calm down. And if it's not hot enough, you can always, if you dip it in and it's not making noise, take it back out so that you can keep warming up the oil until you get it to right there. That sound, it sounds like medium medium noise is, I always liken it to a sitcom laugh is all I'm looking for because I don't want to cook this chicken on the stove top I want to cook this chicken in the oven so to do that I have to first color it and then I'll cook it in the oven because nobody wants boiled looking chicken in their alfredo mm. so a little bit of color on that side and a little louder yeah, so that's how I judge when oil's ready to put something in it. Is if I just like cooking shrimp, I don't want that really loud noise unless I'm trying to sear off the outside of the shrimp and make it sort of crispy. So I wanted about medium sound to a little medium heavy, so like a sitcom laughter, if that makes sense. I hope that makes sense to somebody so I don't feel like a crazy person. Or a golf clap sound, so it's really quiet. It's just a slight, like for delicate stuff, for like fish. If you're doing just fish in a pan, you don't want to attack it with a lot of heat because heat removes water, and on fish, water is vital into making sauce because the minute the water goes, the fat goes. And the only thing that keeps fish soft and palatable and good on your tongue is the fat in the fish. So immediately, immediately you start attacking it with massive heat. That, that fish, that's why they bred like catfish and stuff like that. It's to protect the inside of the fish. Because direct heat to fish really cause a problem. That's why a lot of times you see they'll put the skin side down in a frying pan with direct heat. It's that skin's protecting the meat underneath it. Because it can take the heat, but that, that delicate fish cannot take heat. So it's the same thing. If you look at it like that, it's the same thing with chicken. I don't have skin on this chicken. It's just boneless, skinless chicken breast. So I want to be super careful about how I approach the chicken. I'm going to flip it. Oh, that's got this color. Put this guy, nice color. And that's all I'm looking for. I'm looking for color. I'm not, you know, I know the camera over there is just horrendous. But as soon as it, here I'll show you. Good camera. Yeah, yeah, see that? I just want nice brown on the outside. That creates a little mallard, mallard effect on the outside of the chicken, which brings forth that flavor. And because it's brined, we don't have to worry about the internal flavor of it because it's flavored all the way through now. So it's easier to do with whatever I want after this. So, color in the outside of the chicken. So if you have any questions or if you want to chat, just chat me up. If you want to follow us, is it over there or is it over there? It's, uh, right there? Yeah, right there. There's our little follow button. Give us a little click on our follows. We snagged a few today. We actually got our, our, our sub today, so we're super excited about that. We got a sub. That's awesome. That's that always is always helpful, always surprising. We're always appreciative. So 
So are uh, looking at our chicken? No, uh, yeah, that's going to be cooked a little bit more. Now I know for a fact this chicken is not going to be cooked to 165 degrees on top of the stove. Because if I attempt to cook this chicken on top of the stove, it will destroy the outside of the chicken, especially a boneless, skinless chicken breast. So I have to attack it from all angles. So I just want to color it, and then I'll stick it in the oven, which is radiant heat, and it will slowly cook, just like I did with the steaks. It will slowly cook the inside of the steak, or the chicken breast, so that it turns out, ooh, ooh, ooh. so it turns out to be pink on the outside, but it's cooked through to the right temperature. Yeah, okay, the stove's ready. So heat it up to 350 degrees. So we're going to take our chicken breast, which are beautiful, good color on both sides. Like I said, I'm not worried about the internal temperature right now because I'm going to cook it in the oven. Because I do not want this chicken to cook in the pan. It's just too violent. It's too harsh for that pan. But now i got a nice pan to make my... Thought that was hot. It's not. So I'm gonna put that in the oven. I'm gonna set a 15 minute timer. Get pop my oil. All right, timer. I gotta do it like this. I'm gonna set a 20 minute timer. So I got that chicken breast in there for about 20 minutes. Now I'm going to wait on this because I do not want to sear off my steak yet. So, I hope this is informative. I appreciate you guys coming in. I hope you're having fun. I'm having a tomato. Hum. So, herbs. We want to put some herbs into this to make it Italian. So, I got oregano, basil, and thyme. And then I've got some more parsley. You put that in. Oh shoot, you see how she came to snag that tomato? Hey, hey. Yeah. Alright, she's trashing the place. Sorry about that. Sometimes my tech gets out of the out of the confined spaces. I have to rally her back in. So, we're gonna take some time. store bought time. I know I should grow my own, and I will. I'm going to take it, and I'm going to grab it at the stem, which is up here, the top part, not the stem, but the top, and I'm going to slowly work my way, my okay. two fingers down it to pull off the leaves. Because remember, a spice is the stem, the root, and the seed of the plant, and you will mostly find those dried. So a spice is the stem, the root, and the seed, and the bark, and anything on that plant that isn't the leaf is a spice. So obviously the herb is the leaf. So herbs go in last. They're the last thing you put on a dish before you serve it. Spices go in first and you bloom your spices. Always remember that. That's the best way to know when to put something in a dish is anything that isn't a leaf, which is the bark, like cinnamon, the stem, which is like, um, uh, we have um, coriander, and we've got, oh my gosh, there's a ton of stems that you can use as spices. And then you got seeds, which are like your peppercorns and your nutmeg, and all of those are spices because they are seeds, plants, or seeds, stems roots and bark. So the only thing left is the leaf, which is the actual herb. So herbs are leaves, everything else are spices. So we're going to put our herbs in last because that is what we want. We want that fresh flavor on our dishes. We don't want to put our herbs in because they're super delicate and what happens is they'll start to bitter and brown like almost instantaneously when they hit heat. So if you make spaghetti sauce and you eat it and you have that bitter flavor into it and you put even dry like basil, if you put that into the spaghetti sauce in the beginning, then it has that bitter flavor to it because that's those delicate little leaves. They're basically turning sour on you because you cooked them. 
So we want our herbs to be fresh, and we want them in at the end of the dish. We don't want them in before that. So that's a little little a little way of knowing when to put what in the dish. So I've got these three, and I got some fresh. Look at this thing. See, look at that beautiful fresh Italian parsley. I just want a couple leaves off of this. I don't want to be too too extravagant when it comes to the leaves because parsley leaves are super strong and everyone's like they don't have any flavor a lot of times the reason the parsley doesn't have any flavor is because by the time you get the food in your mouth it has all this other stuff on top of it so I want to make that parsley just sit right on top there and have as much flavor as I can from the parsley leaf Italian standard herb is parsley so there, I got my little pile of leaves that I'm not going to chop up until the last second because I don't want to, um, I don't want them to bruise, I don't want them to turn brown. So for right now, we're just going to leave those there, put away our seasonings, no, we'll put away our herbs. So, like I said, if you have any questions, if you join yourself, please follow us, I would appreciate it. If you're learning something, absolutely. I'm so happy that if you learned something today, that would make me super happy. It would. So, I've got about 14 minutes on my chicken, but this dish here, we're just making the steak alfredo, so there's no reason for me to slow down. The chicken alfredo is for everyone else, and it'll still be done at about the same time. So I want to take this, and I want to heat this up, and I want this pan to get just to the point where it starts to smoke. So I want my smoke point on my olive oil. So, which I believe is 225 degrees. Nobody's here unless it's <laughs> Huh? Do you have a computer in front of you? What? Forget it. The smoke point for olive oil is... Hold on. I want to say it's 325 degrees, I think. That's my guess. I know it's in that, in the general vicinity. Uh, extra virgin? Doesn't matter. Uh, refined is 390 to 470. Okay. Extra virgin is 374. Oh, I was off by 15, 50. So it's 350 degrees, 375 degrees is when extra virgin starts to smoke. But if your oil starts to smoke, it's garbage. So you don't want to bring it to that point. So all I want this oil to do is start to make noise, and then I'm going to cool it down. I'm going to cool it down with my shallots, my shallots. And I want to just start to saute off my shallots. My steak's ready. So as this comes up to heat, my onions are going to get nice and nice. And, I did it again. You guys didn't even stop me. I know. That's what happens. Uh, so I'm going to take my onions. I'm going to stir them around. Oh, it smells amazing. I love shallots. I really do. Shallots will make a dish every time. So to keep them from frying and turning black while this pan heats up, I like to crowd them in a corner. And then if they get to the point where I want them, I'm just going to pull them out and throw them in with the mushrooms. Because all of this is going back in here except for a little bit so that fun time Lissa doesn't get any of the bechamel with mushrooms in it. I'll probably just pick hers out. No, I'll probably pour it in there and then separate it and then throw the, because I want to put this in. I know I'm going to do it. Don't you worry, fans. I got this. So I want to cook my onion just a little bit, waiting for my pan to heat up. That's about right where I want it. So I'm going to take that out. Put that in with my mushrooms. Separate my. Woo, that's hot! So remember, all I'm trying to do right now is bring this pan up to super hot so that I can sear my steaks and create the Maillard. I want a Maillard effect on my steaks. Here we go. Again, we're at that right temperature. I just want to check it. Uh, a little bit hotter. Bring that up a little bit more. And the searing is actually the liquid inside the steak. That's what makes it super, 
That's so dope. Yes, sir, Rex. So, there. You see it's smoking? That's about right where I want it. I'm going to take that. I'm going to... You hear that? Rock concert. Now, I don't want to put the same other shake in the same spot. So I want to put it on the opposite side of the pan. Rock concert. Looks like I'm cooking human. So then you cook the human. Pull out that onion. Pull that out. We're going to color our steak. We're going to check the bottom. Oh, that's beautiful. I always go, and whenever I put the steak back in there, I try and find a different place in the frying pan. Oh, what happened? Oh, sorry. I try and find a different place in the frying pan so that that place is hotter than anywhere else. Because if it had a steak on it, it's already cooling down the metal underneath this steak. So whenever I flip it, I want to find a different spot in the frying pan to put the steak. It's hot. So that's why you don't crowd your steak, so you have room to put it somewhere else where the pan is hotter. So we're, basically change, we're basically chasing around hot spots in the pan. So we're going to color this side. This steak's a beautiful. This is funny, it probably smells like Kevin in there. And bang. Dana. Dana. So then we're going to take our steak and we're going to set it on its side because we want to sear the steak all the way around. Now there's a, we're going to set one on top of the other. And then my cloudy ass camera view. And then we're going to put them next to each other and we're searing off the side. Now some people believe that if you sear off the side it steals in the juice and it really doesn't. It doesn't really do anything other than create more surface millard. That's what we're trying to do. And you see this. Dana's here. I know I saw your car. You can out and saw your car. Oh, there's this one. These steaks are gorgeous. Dana, you want to try this? Yeah, this is good. Yeah, this is good. This is good. This is good. All right, there's our stunned steak. Take those out and set them aside. We're going to put the. What else am I doing? Nothing. I'm making this. I'm making a sauce. So we got the pan. Look at that smoky Joe. Oh, Joe. Oh, now that smells amazing. Now, I want to add the sauce. Well, I want to add about half of this here. I know it's really loud. And it's a little thicker than what I want. I don't know if you guys can hear me. And this rock pot is in here. So, you know, a little bit of milk to break it down because I don't want it that thick. Ooh, I just got the whip over here. Oh, man. Because remember, I've got the cheese in here, and I'm also working with the bechamel. So I, it has a lot of leeway before it will start to get too thin. It can always come back. So right now, all I'm doing is warming this through. I'm not really doing much more to it. I'm just trying to put some heat through it. And if it thins out too much, you can always just sit there and let it simmer, and it will thicken right back up. We'll just push all the water back out of it. So we're going to turn that down. To low. I'm going to add a little more water. Oh, might as well be water. About a little more milk to it. it. Smells good, doesn't it? I got about six minutes on my chicken, but I don't care because the chicken's going in last. And then it will be ready. I'm going to start my pasta water so that this all can come together. Then where I'm at right now with my sauce, I like that. I'll show it to you guys. I know this camera on a stove is just flat garbage. That's what the sauce should look like. 
So you see that? It's got the nice bulky mushroom in it. I'm just trying to warm them back up by using the sauce alone to warm it back up. Nice bulky mushrooms. Nice oh, sauce. No, just no. thick enough to where I can see the bottom of the pan when I move that stuff out of the way. It should cover the back of a spoon. So we're going to taste it. I'm going to taste it. They don't mean to taste it yet. What? I know. I'm a terrible person. So we are now going to taste it and see what we need to do to it. All right. Everything's right there. I just know it needs a little salt. Mm -hmm. It's not going to leave a lot. I just want to put, I know, I'm chasing, you're chasing me around. I'm going to put a little bit of salt in there just to bring out. I don't want to add more cheese because it's already thick, so I'm going to add a little salt, which is really where I was getting my salt from was the cheese. So I just want to bring it up just a little bit because salt should help bring out flavor. It shouldn't cover up flavor. So if you're using salt, like right now, I want to bring out that mushroom flavor. So I add a little salt to help that mushroom to the front. So I believe we are there as soon as I find this pan. We're going to taste it. Uh huh. Oh, that is some good mushroom Alfredo. If I do say so myself. And if you don't believe me, let's do some to tech. Who's supposed to return their spoons when they're done with them, but they're not. Because no. they're a holes. We need to get the plastic spoons. Huh? We need to get like plastic spoons. Yeah, that'd be nice. It means I do the dishes. Like the other day when we were at the farmer's market, plus uh -huh. the tiny spoons. Oh man. So we made our bechamel, mushroom bechamel. We basically added our Pecchiano, Rizzani, Aniano cheese to it <laughs> so that we could make an Alfredo, which is basically it's nice and soupy and thick. It's got some shallots in it. There's some good looking stuff. And we're going to add a pasta. We're going to run pasta into. I think Gatillo's got the vapors over here. The what? The vapors. Oh. <laughs> uh. Painted. Yeah, it's so our chicken has got about three minutes left on it. You want me to still pan it? No. I still have to warm this up one more time just to thin it out just a little bit. But I'm hoping to use some pasta water to thin it out. Just a little bit. I just want to touch it thinner so that it's, it doesn't... Because the colder it gets, the quicker it will congeal back mm. to thick. So I just want it to be a little slightly thinner than what it is. And that's where you can play around with it, because like I told you, the bechamel or the uh, parmigiana is always going to thicken as it gets colder. And so is the roux. So you'll always have the opportunity to thin your sauce back out as you get and so loud, as you get closer and closer to service time. So we got our fresh herbs here. We've got our what we used as our shallot. I've got a lid for my water. So we're good. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, once I warm this back up, I'm going to thin it out just a little bit. Mushrooms look nice and bold. They're not raw, they're cooked through. And they got great, intense flavor. And actually, by using the fawn in the pan, it's, it's flavored your bechamel sauce or your Alfredo sauce with the, that little bit of mushroom flavor to it all the way through. Chicken should be. I'm going to temp my chicken, see where it's at. Remember, I'm shooting for 155 degrees, and then I want 10 degrees carryover to temperature. I don't want to run it, I don't want to cook it in the oven to 165 degrees because then when you pull it out, it goes up to like 175 degrees, and that's kind of over the limit from where you want the chicken breast. These are probably super hot. So let's temp it. Feels great. Is great. Exactly 155. Our temperature on the chicken is good. 
Now I can shut my oven off. My timer's still going to go down because it's a piece of shit timer. Stop timer. There, I got it off. So we're going to put our chicken in. I always think that's hot because I always put it in the oven. Put our Alfredo sauce back here. We're going to grab our chicken and bring it over here and let you see it. Let you see how gorgeous that chicken is. Look at that. That's just chicken fat. So we're going to put that in a bowl. We're going to have to slice this up for the, for the Alfredo. Remember, this is brine, so it's flavored all the way through. I'm going to add that fat back to it, too. Yay, chicken fat. Hey, shh. I'm walking here. Okay, our water's boiling. So we're going to put our pasta in it. Remember, this is the store-bought fresh pasta, which means it's not going to take long to cook. I bought two of them. I think I'm only going to make one right now. If somebody wants more pasta, they can make it themselves. Fair? I will not. I know. <laughs> you don't need a lot of pasta anyway. So you'll be fine. Well, I think I boiled away a little bit too much water. So, warming this up. The trick and the key to what we're doing here is we want everything to come out at the same time, hot and fresh. So we're timing and everything by rotating what we're doing through everything. So everything's going to come up hot and fresh. So right now I'm getting my noodles cooked, which takes really super fast. I'm going to put my steak in the oven so it stays warm. I've already shut my oven off, so we're good on oven temp. So, hope you guys are having fun. Woo. We're almost ready for plate up. Plate up's always fun. As soon as I get my sauce back to where I want it, once I add a little of the pasta water to it, then I'm going to deep pan that and then I'm going to quick saute off my spinach for a base. And I just want to put a little heat. It's a baby spinach. So I just want a little bit of heat through the spinach. I don't want to cook it and have it all fall apart because it's a super delicate leaf. So as soon as my pasta, which is almost ready, as soon as it gets ready, Oh, it's so cloudy out. I mean, I know, it's, I know it's late, but it's like dark outside. 8.30, it usually gets dark by this time, but it looks murky. It looks scurry. I'm a scurry. I'm a scurry of it being dark out. Oh, I'm a scurry. Hey, no, but out there with the monsters. Monsters and homosexuals. So this pasta, because it's fresh, it doesn't take long to cook. Probably about 45 seconds or a minute, and this pasta's done. I can't even see. I know. It's okay. They understand it's pasta. It is pasta. I'm just gonna put you on the main. The main. Yeah, because I'm running all over the place now. Yeah, it's like a crazy crazy no. man. Ah, uh, where'd that come from? No. So. Drain my pasta. We'll save a little bit of that water. Boom. Just, just in case I need to thin my sauce again. I don't think I have to. There's always to be safe. I'm sorry. Take my pan. Grab my bowl. Grab my pasta. Dump it in my bowl. Look at that pasta. Isn't that beautiful? Take my olive oil. Squirt it on my pasta because I like my pasta to have a little flavor of olive oil in it. Flip it, flip it, flip it. Oh, that's beautiful. Now, my pasta, I'm taking my herbs and I'm going to cut up a little bit, not much. About, well, about half of my herbs because I want to put those in my pasta. Okay. Use the chopping or the cutting blade to cut my herbs up, and now I'm using a chopping blade to finish them off. Remember, always keep it down against the table. I'm going to toss that together. 
And we'll look at it. I might add a little more. So basically I have basil, thyme, oregano, and Italian parsley. Your Italian staple herbs, or yeah, your Italian staple herbs are these four. I'm gonna put that in there. I want that contrasting color between the steak, the Alfredo sauce, and the noodles. I want the noodles to be their own special flavor, texture. I don't want them to just be drowned in sauce. So it's super important that I flavor this and taste it. I love it. I want to add a pinch of salt to it, just so it stands out on its own. Not much, a little bit. Like I said, right before I plate it, I get my salt in it. And we'll put a little fresh black pepper in it. For those of you that stuck it out and are ready to see the plate up, here we go. So, my herbs, still gonna cut those, but that's for later. I gotta stir my sauce, make sure I'm just at the right thickness that I want. That's pretty damn close right there. Yep, about where I want it. That's pretty. That's pretty color. Good consistency. All right, here we go. How did plate up, boys and girls? Yeah. Plate. We're gonna add some Alfredo. Or no, I'm sorry, fettuccine noodles to the middle. Set that aside. We're going to get out one of our steaks. And if um, James is here, then we're not cooking this to medium well. I'm sorry, but a good steak should be at the most medium. Medium rare, ideally rare if you're a freaking animal. That's beautiful. So remember, we cooked this steak all the way through before we did anything with it. So now, actually what I want to do is I want to take a little bit of this sauce. I'm going to spoon a little of my sauce onto my pasta. I hope you guys like Alfredo with mushrooms in my sauce because that's what I made for you because I am the boss. <laughs> Do you get that? That's no. right, boys and girls. Nice, heavy, thick Alfredo sauce. Love it. Now we're going to cut up our steak. So we always cut our steak to the thickness that we want. Look at oh, that. That's beautiful. Wow. Give me that chunk you that. just cut off. Wow. See that? Oh, that is beautiful. Can I have it? Nope. <laughs> Cooked all the way through to the same temperature. Now, if you want, you can let it sit on your cutting board where you're getting your final touches just so the the um because you really don't want the myoglobin to start running all over the plate because it will wreck the prettiness of it so if you leave it sit here for a second and usually after you cook it you want to let it chill for like 15 20 minutes before you do anything with it you want to let it sit down and kind of relax so the juices re redistribute through the steak so They've already got their spoons ready over there. I just want a piece of the steak real quick. You'll get it. Don't worry. <laughs> so now I'm going to take my steak. Take my Alfredo. I'm going to take my steak. I'm going to lay it across the top. The whole last steak? Well, yeah, it's for presentation. Both of you will tear through this like friggin' zombies. Here. Open your mouth. 
A piece there, big enough. Mm. That is delicious. Okay. Here's my steak. Now we're going to add our fresh herbs. What I want to do before that? Oh, you know what I didn't do? What I said I was going to do. Oh yeah, the Wilton. That's okay. Well, that's good. Don't worry. Five people are left in here. They're going to love it. I was going to wilt some spinach. And I'll probably do that on the chicken Alfredo paper. Or the chicken Alfredo. But I want to get this spinach with my steak. I know. But like I said, I, I can't. This is going to get finished. I missed. I missed on the spinach. But it'll have some whenever you actually get some. Add some herbs to it. We're going to put some tomatoes kind of around it. Let them hang out. Put these pretty little red guys here. Like that. Then we want to take some herbala herbala. <laughs> it's now regressed to herbala herbala. Yes. And then wow. we want a little bit of our fresh Parmigiana Riani on it on it. So that my friends. Steak Alfredo. With tomato, and then I'll make the spinach one real quick. So, if you want to take pictures of this, I'm knocking Dana out of the way, you got to clean off the cutting board. That's just that's just silly. That it's got. We're gonna take some pictures. Do you want the tomatoes in front of it or behind it? I don't it? care. You, you spin it however you want to do it. You just spin it. And then I'm gonna make the hey, we're kind of chicken. So. Sorry. So if you go over to Instagram, we're going to post a picture of this from today's cooking lesson. I hope you guys learned something. I hope you follow along. Like I said, these little tricks and tips, they're not hard to remember and they're not hard to do, but it will definitely improve your food and it will improve the quality of your food so that you can impress your friends and neighbors. I don't know about your neighbors, that'd be weird. They just hey, I was just hanging out. And I thought that I could come over here and eat some of your food. But I'm going to take some spinach. And all I want to do is put my spinach in a hot pan. I'm going to add a little bit of olive oil to it just to help it kind of have a good color. I'm going to add a touch of salt. And then I want to take some pepper. If I had it in my hand a second ago, let's check here. Hey, dope, how's it going? Bay's in here watching the plate up. We're going to do the chicken one next to it. And I think I think we're going to do the chicken one on that long Because I got three three pieces of chicken. Yeah. So I'm going to do a chicken one on this. That's a lot. That's a lot right there. So I take my fresh pasta. And I start to work it. On my dish. That's good. This would be like a party tray. <laughs> I'm going to take my tomatoes. Oh, what am I doing this, guys? You're not helping me out at all. Oh, hey, get that hey, spinach. Hey, get that spinach on get there. Get that spinach on there. Sorry. Sorry. Hey, hey, get that spinach on there. That's enough. That's enough. <laughs> that is enough.
So I'm going to take my spinach and I'm just slightly wilting it. So I don't have to put a lot of heat to it. And I got a little bit of olive oil in here. And spinach is done when you smell it. That's all you want. Boom, spinach is done. So we're going to take some spinach, right. place it on here. As well, soon as you done. smell it, as soon as you smell it, that spinach is done. Put that. We kind of want to push it out to the edge so you can see it under the plate. Probably going to need more spinach, which is okay. Because we will have more spinach. That's right. Just a little wilted baby spinach to go underneath it. Make it pretty. We're going to have to mix more for Gabby's steak. I don't know if she's going to stab me in my face. With so. spoons. If I don't put spinach on your steak, I know you do. But for right now, we are just fancying this up. doesn't have the mushrooms in it for the uh, chicken alfredo add the milk to it and we just turn the heat on to this so I'm gonna whisk it or I'm gonna stir it because I don't have a whisk because I got yelled at because I use a whisk in the bottom of my pan that's right calm down so this one now remember, we, we took our chicken breast and we brined it. And then we just seared it off in a pan for color. And then we stuck it in the oven to finish it. So, when we take our chicken out, which is breast, which is usually notoriously dry, we're going to take our chicken, get our our thingy, get our chicken out. So this chicken cooks for about 25 minutes. There is our chicken. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful chicken. It's hot as all get out. Add that to there. Add a little bit of that chicken fat and flavor to the bechamel just to make it pretty. Mm, good idea. So I'm going to add all of it. So while it sat in that little bowl, it gave off a little bit of the liquid. So, shut my oven off. So we're going to cut our chicken. We're going to start, and you can either cut it this way, or you can cut it this way. So we cut it this way. We just want to cut it in decent size, edible chunks. Just for plating. And if you're doing like you're doing this for two or four people, then they each get their own little section, and it's great for plate up. Okay, I'm gonna take it and set it on our fancy schmancy plate. Yeah, let's do it again. Put our pasta on there. Tuck that in a little bit. You're like three balls. Yes. What? I'm just watching your stuff on the lag. Am I lagging? No. Oh, okay. I'm lagging. Oh. Well, I don't want you to lag, Dana. Yeah, but I get to see it. It's like instant. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. It's a delay, not a lag. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pasta, beautiful red color. Take my first chicken breast and push it open. Lay that on there like this. Maybe my tomato on there. There we go. I actually want it a little thinner, I think. I'm going to cut this way on this one. 
Are you not going to need that piece? No, I'm not going to need that piece. Working the chicken. Ow. You Just yourself? kidding. No, I didn't cut myself. <laughs> it was a joke. It was a joke and you fell for it. It was a joke. <laughs> I'm going to cut a little thinner just so they fold better, so they sit on the chicken better. This is enough for three people. Who am I kidding? I'm actually going to pull some of this back off because I want to be able to see the stuff underneath it. Then, Alfredo sauce. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, yeah. Two dishes. What do you think, guys? Not you. Oh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Not you, rude. Huh. Look at that. I figured someone had to cheer for you. Yeah. First you want our support and then we give it to you and you shoot us down. <laughs> nope, that's I'm not what's happening. That's this girl. <laughs> yeah. That, my friends. spinach in it, which I should have done with the steak, but I didn't, because I'm an a-hole. We're going to take our chopped up herbs, we're going to sprinkle that over there, over there, over there, and back on that first one. We're going to take our fresh, well, that's interesting, a little bit there, a little bit there. Put it there. Then, so um, this is it. We've done two dishes today. Basically the same. I always like to mimic, which I should have done in the first place. But if you're doing Italian food, they always like to make it the same color as their flags. So you usually end up with a green, a red, and a white. So. that. I'm going to adjust the camera on that one too. Why does everything look blown out all the time? Answer me. Because, uh. So, that, and then we got our steak alfredo, which now I have to saute some spinach out for, so if you want to take pictures, now is the time to do it. But my texts are asleep. No, I'm trying to figure out how to raise somebody. Food coma. Yeah, food coma. Not yet. About to be. So, like I said, tomorrow night we're going to probably do some more pasta stuff. And then we're going to um, move on to Friday. We're going to do dessert, d dessert day. I believe, no, wait, tomorrow we're doing chicken masala, right? Um, I think so, yeah. Okay. Good. The special one. There's a special That's one? That's different than all the other ones that are on the menu. Do you remember? Yes. Yes. Let's turn this back on. Get a better light. Taking dark pictures. Yeah, I am. So we're going to take some pictures. Like I said, go to Instagram. If you want to see these pictures. I already got to go to another bean. So, um, that's it. We did it, guys. We made two dishes. We need to put this somewhere, like in the Alfredo sauce, which would be great. Did you just eat a piece of chicken? No. Woman. Yeah, you want a piece of Dana? He wants one. Go for my piece. Well, I gotta make spinach, remember? So, 
That's our stream for today. I, are we going to raid somebody? What's going on? Are we doing after something like that? Do you can eat after, after <laughs> we're done. Me, for Dana. Oh, my Lanta. Let me get the, let me get the gargoyle out from behind the tent. She comes at you. <laughs> so like I said, we're going to saute up a little spinach for our steak one. Which I think would have been way creamier. So that's our chicken marsala. No, what the hell am I talking about? <laughs> that is our chicken alfredo, and that is our steak alfredo with mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to add a little spinach to our steak alfredo to make it even prettier. Like I said, we're going to saute our spinach up just a little bit. As soon as you smell the spinach, it's done. You don't have to cook it until it falls apart. Now, regular spinach, this is baby leaf, this is baby spinach, so it, regular leaf spinach takes take some effort to cook. But baby spinach, it cooks really fast. So we're just putting a little baby leaf spinach around it so that it has some color. more spinach for the crazy people so um that's it folks tomorrow like i said we're doing a cheesecake no oh we're yeah, doing chicken, chicken masala tomorrow masala. yes which i love i love it we're going to do all of our herbs fresh our spices fresh i'm going to teach you about them i'm going to bloom them in front of you so that you can get that strong strong really strong deep marsala flavor so, I hope you guys join us. I think we're set up for a raid. I assume that's what's happening. Is she there? Yeah, yeah. she's on right now. Then yeah. All right, guys, we're gonna go read. We're gonna go raid a friend. Uh, Leia lays lunch. Uh, Leia loves lunch. Leia, Leia loves lunch. Leia sorry. Loves lunch. Leia loves lunch. And tell her that you guys had fun here, or that we suck, but mostly, mostly that we had fun here. And come back next. Please follow us. Subscribe. Do everything you want to do. And thank you so much. You can hit it. Chat.